Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, September 28th, and a meeting of the Salem County School District Board is called to order. Uh, all, all school board members are present. Uh, Director Hyen is online. So I'd like. Good catch. Hello, can you hear us? Okay, she's okay. good now, okay. all right. So I'll start over. Good afternoon, when I started this. Today is uh, Tuesday, September 28th, and a meeting of the Salem Kaiser School uh, District Board is called to order. All school board members are present uh, with Director Hyen online. So, um, I'd like to start off with today with a um, welcoming message. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Welcome y bienvenidos to the Salem Kaiser School Board District 24J meeting where we will strive to be inclusive, respectful, and welcoming to our students, staff, educators, administrators, board members, and all community members. Furthermore, I want to welcome people of all genders, people of African descent, black, African American, Asian descent, Arab descent, European descent, those who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, people indigenous to this land, and people of mixed and multiple descents. 
Languages spoken in our communities are welcome. Spanish, English, indigenous languages, sign language, Chukis, Somali, Russian, Chinese, Vietnamese, and many more. People with dis disabilities, visible and invisible. People of all religions, believers, and all faiths or creeds. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, pansexual, queer, or others for whom none of the labels fit. Survivors, your emotions, joy, bliss, grief, rage, indignation, contentment, disappointment. Your families, genetic or otherwise. Our veterans who proudly serve and currently serve in our country. Our elders, those here in this room, in our lives, and those who have passed away. Yes, and finally I'd like to welcome the ancestors who lived in this land where we are now. Welcome the spirits of the San Am, Kalapuya, Siletz, and Grand Ron, the natives who lived in this area before the Europeans came. I'd like to acknowledge them and invite their spirits to this place. Welcome y bienvenidos. Now if we can all stand and um, pledge say the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, in liberty and justice for all. Okay, moving on with the agenda. There are no agenda modifications today. So we'll go right into our reports with Superintendent Perry. All right, welcome everyone. It's uh, great to be at CTEC tonight. I hope you had a chance to meet our fabulous students who are with us tonight. They'll be part of a presentation and you'll be able to ask them a few uh, questions. But thank you for being here uh, tonight and welcoming us. Uh, this is an important moment in the time of history of CTEC. Um, we have, this has been um, probably a labor of love for about <laughs> six of us in this room who have been here since the start of uh, the CTEC conversation. Um, in part, uh, when I was hired, this was also on the agenda in a memorandum of understanding with Mountain West Investments. So we do have um, some guests on the line, but this is the agenda for tonight. We're gonna do a program overview, history of the board actions and the lease, an environmental executive summary, and then you'll have time for questions and answers. And then we're gonna round out the night with Melissa Glover uh, to just share a little bit about our community transition programs. Um, on the line with us is uh, Jason Tokarski from Mountain West Investments. Jason, we won't be able to see you yet. Um, and then Lynn Green, who's an environmental consultant for us to answer your questions as well. And then uh, Mike, is there anyone else on the line from technical? No, nope. okay. All right, so I'm gonna start with a tribute uh, in memory of Chuck Lee because uh, it was Chuck who was on the board at the time. And he had this interesting way of navigating um, division and also a very tricky transaction that the board was entering into because he was employed and represented Mountain West Investments and was on the Salem Kaiser School Board and was really hired to um, see CTEC from idea to implementation. And so it's kind of a bummer that Chuck's not here tonight because he would be thrilled that we're at this moment in time. Um, the hashtag be like Chuck is, I think his family is starting this campaign. And what that means is to be kind. Um, he was a uh, statesman. He brought sides together. He understood on the board uh, how to keep focused on students, but also he understood when he had to step back because his job with Mountain West Investments was a conflict of interest at times with the decisions of the board. And that is a super tricky place to navigate and to navigate as a board member, he was also charged with the implementation of a district program by Mountain West Investments. So uh, to be like Chuck means um, be kind, uh, be a statesman, uh, bring sides together, uh, know, your, know your power and where you can and can't use it was a really um, big lesson um, from him. So um, I had a chance to uh, attend his services just 
Sunday, whatever day it was. And so um, just to his wife, uh, Karina, uh, thanks for the way you lended Chuck to us. All right, so with that, I'm gonna, um, and I think if we take down the slideshow, will Jason be able to be seen on the screen? So, okay, Ethan, could you take just take down? the, yeah, just no for problem. a minute. So I wanna um, introduce you to Jason Tokarski, who is uh, the, I think he's the president now of Mountain West Investments or the vice president, but he often, all the time, uh, works on behalf of his uh, dad and many of the projects that his dad has vision for. And so very early on in the um, time together, Jason and I, uh, realized that this was so different. We needed uh, time together to make the decisions from the highest levels of the organization. So uh, Jason and I have spent uh, weekly meetings for about five years making big decisions and little decisions about things like carpet. So Jason, <laughs> uh, welcome to our school board. Thanks for um, being here with us tonight. And if you could just um, talk a little bit about uh, your dad, his dream, and um, the public-private partnership, that would be great. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Thank you, Christy, and, and thank you to the school board members for having me participate tonight. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, grateful for technology that's, that brings us together. Um, it, truly a labor of love, Christy. I think you nailed it when you, you uh, labeled it that. Definitely a labor, a labor of love. And you know, tonight also, of course, a little, a little bittersweet as I as I too pondered um, coming together and having this particular discussion tonight, right on the heels of of Chuck's passing and his his funeral services. Um, I just I'm so thankful for. Um, Chuck's leadership and determination, and and I I'm confident that um, we are all honoring him in in a way in, in coming together tonight to to have this important discussion. Um, also, just want to say a, a, a genuine and sincere thank you to, you know, to Christy, to you, to um, all of those uh, employees that that have worked so hard. Um, on and continue to work so hard to make CTEC uh, a success. Uh, I feel like I made great friends uh, over the years in, in being able to work with you and others. And that's been a real blessing and joy uh, for me in my life. And this truly, you know, this, this public private partnership, um, we always talk about how unique that is and um, absolutely uh, unique and kind of one of a kind um, in, in terms of delivering a, a career technical education center to uh, to a community, and you know it took <laughs> it took a a giant leap of faith, um, a, a whole heck of a lot of hard work and patience, um, and a, and a lot of wonderful people and organizations that I could I could never you know um, make a list long enough to to touch on all those who have impacted uh, for good this project and, and made it possible. But, um, you know, that that um, amazing public-private partnership that was created out of truly faith and hope and hard work and, um, but but the beauty, you know, a common vision that, um, and, you know, Christy, I always love the way that you say this, we just wanna do good things for kids. And, um, you know, I think that's what my dad would say too. Um, uh, he would say, we just want to do good things for kids. In particular, with this project, you know, his, his initial vision was this, this great desire to have a place that would um, train the, the, the youth um, in important career technical um, educational opportunities and, and have them uh, job ready, have them able and ready to, to be in, enter the workforce and and participate in filling um, what feels like a pretty significant uh, technical labor debt that we have in this country. And, and here, was, here was a beautiful way to um, begin to fill that gap and to fill that need and create amazing opportunities for, uh, for the youth in the Salem-Kaiser School District. And there's no doubt that, that CTEC has done that uh, through this great public-private partnership and the and the continued wonderful leadership that takes place uh, at the school 
uh, each and every day. So I just think this is a uh, this is a beautiful moment. It does great honor to um, to Chuck. It does great honor to um, my dad and you know the two of them in their earliest conversations about um, why to do this and what this could be. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be able to to be here tonight and um, participate in any way that I can as we uh, take this um, hopefully monumental step of of the the transition of the of the property to the school district so thank you again for for having me with you tonight all right thanks jason so next on our agenda is um and ethan you can go ahead and put the slides back up is i'm gonna uh, hand the clicker and the podium to Principal Rhodes. And this is uh, Principal Rhonda Rhodes. She's the principal at uh, our Career Technical Education Center. And she has um, brought with her some amazing students to uh, tell a little bit about our program and uh, what's, um, what they do here at this site. So welcome, and I'll pass it to you. Hi, my name is Gia Israel, and I'm a first year cosmetologist at CTEC. Um, I'm planning to specialize in aesthetics and hopefully make my way up to become a dermatologist. But you know, sometimes you know you want to do all the things at once, and we offer a lot of things at CTEC, so I wish I could do more. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I'm here for, and I'm really excited about graduating and getting uh, my license. Hello, my name is Osvaldo Guzman. I'm a year two at Culinary Arts Management Program. I'm a senior at North Salem High School. Uh, my career goals after CTEC is to go to business school and hopefully one day open uh, a whole bunch of culinary establishments. Hi, my name is Noah. Um, I go to West Salem High School. I'm also here at CTEC for my second year of manufacturing. I'm also taking a good opportunity at Chemeketa to get some certifications for machining. And after CTEC, I would like to get a career in fabrication and welding. And I'm Rhonda Rhodes, principal at CTEC. So once again, welcome. It is our pleasure to be hosting the board uh, here on our site tonight. And uh, these students donated their night to really share their CTEC story with you. So let's give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, you've heard our origin story um, from the people who've been here since the beginning and made it all happen. And you've heard about our unique public-private partnership. What we are here to do this evening, the four of us, is to really share the operational side of what takes place at CTEC. Um, in everything we do here at CTEC, we really strive to maximize the impact of this generous gift that was given to our community, um, to fulfill our promise to Mountain West to have industry at the table, and to transform as many lives as we possibly can. Um, Chuck Lee always said, Larry built CTEC because he wanted to give kids hope. And so we are here tonight to show you exactly how we do that. Uh, we'll start with the specs. So this was a $17 million project. Um, if you weren't here in the early days for this work, Mountain West purchased this 145,000 square foot building uh, that we're sitting in, that we're gathered in this evening. They paid to remodel two program spaces per year and outfitted it with the state of art, state of the art industry equipment over a five year period of time and leased it all to the Salem Kaiser Public Schools for a dollar a year which as it turns out, is a really good deal. <laughs> um, they did this so that we could create 10 incredible programs to serve 11th and 12th graders from across our entire district in two-year programs of study. So Salem-Kaiser public school students have the opportunity as part of their free and public education to prepare for a lucrative career path in one of our 10 industries. Through our unique integrated curriculum, which some of these young people are gonna share more about in a moment, students take two CTE courses and two core classes per year here on our campus. So let's take a peek at the 10 industries that we represent. In the first year of CTEC, the 2015-16 school district, uh, we rolled out with two programs, manufacturing, welding, and engineering. And basically just imagine our students can design and fabricate virtually anything you can come up with out of metal. 
And that first year, we also opened our residential construction program. So our students literally design, build, and sell a single family home each year. The next year, we rolled out two new programs at SeaTech. In that lower corner, that's an image from our video and game design animation program. Our teacher from this program moved here from Ireland to work for a little company you may have heard of called Disney. He helped to make the movie Avatar. So everything they create in that program is just extremely cool. Uh, that year, we also opened our incredible cosmetology program. This is our very largest and most popular program. As part of their beauty college education, our students literally operate a full service student run salon that's stunning and huge and open to the public. So you all should come in and get services when we open in October. <laughs> in year three at SeaTech, we opened our drone technology and robotics program. This was a challenge because it's such an emerging industry and the technology is ever changing. You make an equipment list one year and it's already out of date <laughs> six months later. Um, but I've learned a lot in planning for this program. We have the latest high tech programming, microcontrollers, electronics, mission planning, and flight operations. Uh, I won't go into more detail because I don't quite understand it, um, but our students do and that's what's important. We opened in that third year our auto body repair and painting program. And in that program, our students liter literally earn certifications in auto detailing, body tech, auto estimating, and automotive painting. In the fourth year of C-Tech, we opened our law enforcement criminal justice program. So students in that program have the opportunity to serve their community in careers like 911 emergency dispatchers, attorneys, forensic scientists, and even FBI interns. We also opened in the fourth year of the rollout our business development and leadership program. So our business students take on clients like small business owners and sole proprietors in the community, and they create multimedia content for them, um, for things like their social media campaigns, uh, short videos, newsletters, and digital marketing. One of our greatest challenges was opening our last two programs just a few months before the pandemic unexpectedly hit us all. So our two youngest programs are our culinary arts and management program and our sustainable plant science and technology program. <coughs> our culinary program, students have the opportunity to learn all aspects of the food service industry. So prepping, baking, cooking, they will be opening a cafe right here on our campus in just a few months. We're actually borrowing the tables from the cafe and that's what you're seated at at this moment. And uh, eventually they'll be operating their own food truck businesses. Our plant science program, uh, students learn to propagate new plants, clone and propagate new plants using high-tech indoor aeroponics like the tower that you might see behind you, uh, hydroponics and other sustainable practices. So that's a glimpse at the 10 programs that we have to offer. Now, students from across our two cities access CTEC's 10 programs, meaning that CTEC is truly a cross-section of our community. The demographics of SeaTech literally mirror the demographics of our district as a whole in nearly every manner. So in terms of racial and ethnic diversity, the percentage of students with disabilities, English learners, talented and gifted students, they're all present on our campus in almost the identical percentages as what you would find in our district as a whole. Um, the only exception to that would be gender. We're just a little bit male heavy. Uh, some of our programs appeal just a little bit more to young men than, than young ladies, and we're working to recruit more females into those programs as well. Uh, but the reason that we're able to reflect the demographics of our entire community is because we share students with each of the high schools in our district. So uh, while students in our program take four classes here at SeaTech, they remain a member of their resident school. Um, for their other four classes. So if you are a North Salem Viking like Osvaldo, you can access all the benefits that SeaTech has to offer and maintain your connection, maintain your identity to your resident school. It was really important to us at SeaTech that students don't have to choose, that they can have it all. So at this time, Osvaldo, can you share what it's like to be a Viking and a SeaTech culinary student? Once again, my name is Osvaldo Guzman, and I am a Viking at North Salem High School. So this is actually my last year at North Salem High School. And uh, this year, uh, aside from CTEC, I am the ASB student body president. 
Uh, so I'm very connected in the school, although being here at CTEC. Thank you very much. Uh, I do programs like Mecha, uh, which is like our Latino club at North Salem High School. And this year, I actually um, very honored that uh, some of my teachers chose me to be in our new program that we're offering at North Salem High School, which is our Unified Sports. I don't know if any of you guys have heard from that, but this is the first year that North Salem High School does this. And I'm one of our first partners, which is amazing. The most amazing program I've ever been besides CTEC because that's number one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm actually still involved in sports aside from all of that. So I do cheer and track. So I'm North Salem's biggest cheerleader and I am CTEC's biggest cheerleader here too. <laughs> and, and unified sports. And unified sports. <laughs> yes, I'm on the sidelines and I'm like, you know, you go get it. Like, Very aggressive. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Oswaldo is a perfect example of someone who's making the most out of their education, both at CTEC and at North Salem High School. Um, so how do we do this operationally on the CTEC side? Um, how do we create the competitive advantage that we promise to our students? We basically started with an underlying principle, and that is the best preparation for an activity is the activity itself. I learned this from athletic coaches growing up. If you want to hit a baseball, you need to get up to the plate, face live pitching, swing the bat, get feedback, get back up there, and do it again. Um, but oftentimes in traditional school, we don't, we don't quite implement that. So we started with this concept and we said, you know what, if you want students, if the ultimate goal, if you want students to perform as professionals in the workplace, if that's our ultimate goal, then we need to provide them with opportunities daily to perform as professionals in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, this is our mission statement. CTEC is a dynamic working environment where students acquire the professional skills the technical skills and the academics they need to graduate with a competitive advantage. So many times in traditional schools, we focus on academics, solely on academics. And even if the academic pillar is really, really, really strong, that's still a single leg stool. That doesn't hold up out in the workforce. So at CTEC, what we strive to do is create that strong academic leg without neglecting, giving equal weight to the professional skills and the technical skills. And then you're balanced and you're job ready, just like Mr. Tokarski talked about uh, in the opening. So at CTEC, what we do is we run everything we do through what we refer to as the workforce lens. And then we model things after the workplace as closely as possible. So at this time, I'd like to have Gia come and talk about what it looks like in the cosmetology program um, to really reflect and mirror the workforce. And, and Rhonda, if our students can just speak a little bit um, uh, louder so that our interpreters can hear them, that would be great. All right, once again, I'm Gia, and I'm a year one cosmetologist. Um, so in cosmetology, we're always hands-on. Once we're done learning about you know cosmetology theory and doing our English and science programs, um, we start going into the salon and getting everything ready, professionally sanitized. Um, so we make sure everything's very clean so that, you know, there's no kind of bacteria that could infect anyone. Um, so the services that we provide are also very professional. We do pedicures, manicures, hairstyling, barbering. You know, it's, it's a lot of things that we do and that we offer. And we just like to keep everything, you know, very fun. And every day is just a new learning experience and it's like a, a real job. We wear um, professional clothing, you know, and you know, there's never a dull day in cosmetology. All right, thank you, Gia. Uh, I remember one of my first days here at CTEC, a cosmetology student was asked to call and order some more product from Paul Mitchell, and she said, can I have my mom call? <laughs> <laughs> and our staff said, no, you're, you're gonna call, but we'll, we'll teach you how to do it. And um, the reason that was so important and stuck with me is because when we asked our industry partners what they value the most, we thought it would be the technical skills that we're teaching them, right? Like programming a drone or welding. But it was actually the professional skills that they said mean the most to them. Uh, the showing up on time, the shaking of hands, taking initiative, working well as part of a team, um, or making a professional phone call or sending a professional email. And so we explicitly teach these skills, we practice them, 
and then we give them feedback on their professionalism. Most young people have never had the opportunity to be taught and then get feedback on their professionalism. Uh, Ozzy, can you come up and share what it's like to build professional skills in the culinary arts and management program? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry. So a little bit of going into our professional skills that we learn at CTEC. Uh, I feel like I could divide it halfway between professional skills needed in the culinary industry and professional skills that I could relate to any industry or any job that I would like to get. Uh, I'm confident enough to do an interview uh, we learned that in C-Tech, in our culinary industry too. We do mock interviews. I know, I'm confident in writing an, uh, a resume. Uh, we've actually had somebody, um, the last class that we had, come in and show us how to professionally write a resume and get, uh, get us that first step into that job and that lineup. Um, sorry, professional skills in culinary related. Uh, it would be professionally and accurately describing a dish um, from the smell, the aromas that come out of that dish, the flavor-wise. Um, I know when I need a call out of work, I know how to do that, how to leave a good voicemail, how to write a professional email when I'm not going to be at work, when I'm going to be late, and I know the professional skills to keep other people safe. I know my food safety and science, and that's just in my program. I know that in every other program, they have their own safety protocols that we all follow, and those are very professional skills that are established in our program because we're dealing with customers and oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it'd be kind of bad if something went wrong with our customers and CTEC is all about that professionalism. Um, there's so much that I actually wrote a whole list but I won't go down uh, through that list but yeah I feel like one of the most important is our interviews and uh, as ambassadors like we saw today we're confident enough shaking your hand looking at you in the eyes and telling you my name is Osvaldo Guzman I want to be a business leader uh, I want to open up my own business for uh, cosmetology, we're confident in telling you that because those are the professional skills that we learn here at T-Tech. I think he's taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so while our industry partners place tremendous value on the professional skills um, or job readiness or soft skills, whatever you like to call them, the excitement of learning the technical skills is literally what draws students into the doors at CTEC. Um, students walk through the doors because they see a future for themselves here. They see an opportunity to turn their passions and their interests into careers that will bring security to their future and their future families. So each program has multiple technical skills and certifications that are available leading to multiple career paths. So I just want to dispel the myth that one program leads to one job or one career. Um, that's not the case here. We're not about closing doors. We're about opening doors for young people. Um, so, ex for example, in the manufacturing program um, that Noah's in, students learn MIG, TIG, and stick welding. They learn drafting, um, designing, machining. So we literally have alumni employed all over our city welding as machinists, as pipe fitters, as electricians, as engineers. The technical skills um, and the certifications can get students immediate entry into the workforce at a living wage or can give them an advantage writing a personal essay for a scholarship to the university. Um, and some of them really what they need the most, right now the most competitive thing is the apprenticeships. Electricians <laughs> apprenticeships are so competitive right now, those are great careers. Um, and our students are at the top of the list because we ask our industry partners, how do we get them to the top of the list? They tell us and we do it. Um, so that's a big part of our, of our technical skills here. Um, the certifications also are a great advantage to our students. Um, the certifications they get for free here on our campus would literally cost them tens of thousands of dollars if they were to pursue them as adults. So Gia is going to leave here as a licensed esthetician. She'll be able to work immediately in a salon or med spa. That's saving her about $25,000 um, if she were to do that after she graduated. Our auto body students are earning ICAR certifications. If you ran an auto body shop and you hired a different adult who didn't come to you with these certifications, it would cost you thousands of dollars. So they're knocking down the doors to hire our students. Three of our students are employed right up the road at Hyacinth Auto Body because it's a great deal for body shop owners. So these professional, I'm sorry, these technical skills and certifications are a huge competitive advantage to our students. Um, but sometimes I think the greatest benefit, especially when I look at our, our 
class pass rates, our grade rates, and our graduation rates. Sometimes I think the greatest advantage is the benefit they get from the integrated academics. Because students are spending half of their time here on our campus for the last two years of their high school career, we have to give them half of their graduation requirements, um, which means some of their core classes. So as we do that, all students here at CTEC, as part of their program, take their English class here with us, but their English standards are not taught in isolation. They're not randomly reading Beowulf. Um, their English standards are taught through the lens of their industry. And then each program is paired with one other core subject that makes sense for the program, either math, science, or social studies. Uh, so for example, a student in our law or criminal justice program, they might walk into their criminal justice class and there's a crime scene. So there they are, they're taking photos, lifting fingerprints, bagging and tagging evidence. In English, they write up the police report. In social studies, they try the case. But everything is connected. And what our students find is that it helps things make a lot more sense. And for some of our students, it makes them more interested and it makes them more successful. And that was the experience that Noah had in our manufacturing program. So I'd like for him to share with you. All right, so throughout my um, high school career, I've always been able to get through the classes and pass the classes, but what, what was hard for me was fully understanding what I was learning. And through CTEC, they've given me a great opportunity to get hands-on work, which is what I was looking for. And then after I do that hands-on work, I go directly to an English class where I'm writing a bid letter for the table that I'm in the middle of making. And that itself directly relates itself to the math class that I'm learning right after that. And for me, being able to just have all of these classes that directly connect to themselves help me understand what I'm learning a lot better and helps the quality of my schoolwork improve. And Noah was maybe the happiest student I've ever seen when we came back to in-person <laughs> learning. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, so absolutely, when things are connected, they make more sense. Um, students are motivated to read and write and solve problems when the problems have meaning to them. And so what we try to do with our integrated curriculum is not just connect the courses to each other, but to center those courses around their authentic work. And what that means is to the greatest degree possible, all of the products that we create or the services that we offer are for real customers and clients in the community. And this has been really important. When I taught math, I tried as hard as I could to make things relevant. Um, you know, I would say, uh, pretend that you're gonna have a banquet for 200 people. Imagine you're going to build a deck. But we never built it. And that was the gap that I couldn't bridge all by myself, um, teaching math at several of our schools here in town. Um, but here at CTEC, when you learn to calculate the angle at which a board needs to be cut, it's because you're about to make some roof rafters. And I remember begging students in math class to check their work, and they were like, no, I'm good. Here, kids just by themselves are like, well, let's do those calculations again before we cut it, because they want that roof rafter to be right. Uh, a big part of this is that we do this in partnership with industry. So each one of our programs has an industry advisory council that literally helps make curricular decisions. They tell us what they want to see in students' portfolios, um, what they want to see on their resumes, and um, they help us make decisions down to which pieces of equipment to purchase. So they're really the guiding force. They come onto campus to do mock interviews. Uh, they come onto campus to train and work alongside our students. They invite us into their companies so students can understand a day in the life. And then in the spring, uh, they line up here and conduct interviews with our students for actual jobs that they have available. And our graduates, dozens of them, leave that day with their first real job uh, or their first high wage job. For some of them, they actually leave with their dream job, um, which is pretty exciting. Okay. I think this worked the whole time until <laughs> we got to the very end. Um, if you think you've been to CTEC, I would invite you to come back and take another tour because we're always looking for the next innovation. So if you think you were here the first year of CTEC and you believe you've seen our residential construction program, um, we've been building a house each year since we opened, but a couple of years ago, we started a home design contest. Our students literally design the home that gets built, and I don't know anyone anywhere doing that. Our latest innovation this year is that students who enter as juniors into the program can literally leave as a licensed building code inspector. 
at 18 with no bills living at home as a licensed building code inspector. Uh, I'm really nice to our kids now in case I need to borrow some money <laughs> later. <laughs> um, so the big question is, is it working? What's the return on investment? And being in the public sector, I now feel like I have one foot in public education and one foot in the private sector. And I've learned that return on investment is important and that the only way to know is to track it. So we have an outside organization out of Eugene, Oregon that collects this data for us. And the last four years, our graduation rate has fluctuated between 98 and 100%. Last year it was 99.7. We had one student who didn't cross the stage. And, um, and I'm like, we gotta plug these gaps. So <laughs> we're going for 100% every year. Um, our positive placement rate, according to this data collection company in Eugene, was 92%. Uh, positive placement is placement into a high wage industry career, an apprenticeship or trade program, uh, community college or university, or the military. Um, so if a student reports that they are uh, bagging groceries at Roths, um, we love Roths, they've been good to Salem Kaiser, but that doesn't count because they didn't need CTEC's competitive advantage for that job. Um, so with that definition in mind, our positive placement rate is, is 92% according to our alumni survey. This last year, we had two students from our construction program uh, who were hired by one of our industry partners, $47 an hour. Incredible. Uh, one of our young men who um, had some learning disabilities in our, in our manufacturing program was hired as a machinist, $18 an hour, about a month before the end of the school year. By the time he crossed the stage, three weeks later, they had already given him his first raise to $21 an hour. Um, if you walk into Salon 554, your stylist will probably be a graduate from our cosmetology program. Um, so it's, it's their stories. It's their stories. Um, that lead me to believe that we're really fulfilling the CTEC promise to strengthen our community, uh, to change the trajectories of futures by giving kids hope. Um, another round of applause for these young people for spending their evening with us. So I'm gonna, the, I think we wanna be able to let our students go home. So I'm gonna open it up, maybe if we had a couple questions for Rhonda or students from the board, it would be, this would be a great time to ask some questions and then we'll let them go home. Go ahead, Dr. Chendiger. Do I push this and see? Thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, such a hopeful presentation. Thank you. You know, you gave us all these examples and it just feels so good. It's almost like a project based. You go into medical school, you start with a patient and you figure out everything else. And, and that's what it reminded me. So thank you for doing this. I think there's one thing you didn't mention, which I was thinking, you know, we got like 13,000 or so high school students throughout about 7,000 or 8,000 come to you. I think you're doing some miracle here. I think the miracle you're probably doing is, it's almost like realizing the dream of Brown versus Board of Education. You just brought in an amazing mix of people and giving them hope and then the real value of mixing and matching and then learning from each other and working together. This is a very hopeful story. And what would it take to scale it up so that at least on a wishful list, all 13,000 could have learned some of these elements back in their school or here? What does it take to scale it up so 100% can at least hope for some model like this? I think right now our CTE department for our entire district is working really, really hard to uh, scale up our CTE offerings on each one of our high school's campuses. Um, so for example, if, if medical, if medicine is your passion, we don't have that program here at CTEC, but luckily you can access that CTE program of study in one of our resident high schools. And I think in the last few years since CTEC was built, um, we've had the chance with bond dollars and, and things like that to pour into our resident high school CTE programs. Um, you know, our building is incredible, it's stunning, it's state of the art. 
But boy, I walked into North Salem High School after the Wanderick the other day, and I was like, this place is nice. And their CTE programs also looked incredible. So I think that work is underway. Um, I don't know if one of our leaders want to add to that or if I covered that. So I'll just uh, make a statement about that. We have 52 state-approved programs. Uh, only 10 of them are at CTEC. So while CTEC is amazing, we have 52. So every high school has CTE programs. They have to have a program of study. They have to uh, articulate to a community college. And I think in a given year, I think we have about 8,000 kids in our high schools take at least one uh, CTE uh, course. And the innovation of CTEC has really helped us think, the resident high school think how to expand uh, CTE offerings. And the bond has really helped that. Uh, if you walk into McKay and South, you'll also see really premier CTE spaces at this point. Just a qu quick uh, thing. It's more like you're not tied to your zip code. Anybody can come here and work together and you know create such a beautiful thing. That's what uh, impressed mm -hmm. me. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, Rhonda. You, what the work that you're doing is uh, is amazing. Uh, the skills that you're giving these students is, I'm a little bit jealous. I wish I had those skills when I was at that age. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I just want to give you, uh, you know, all the support that we can to pr continue building those partnerships um, with our students and with our business partners. And uh, something for the students, I have a question for the students if you all want to take a time to answer this. You know, do you feel a little bit, um, that you have an advantage over maybe some of your friends that are not in the CTEC program, and how, how do you continue to encourage them with their academics, and how well do you do with your high school academics? Mm -hmm. um, and like, because that sounds like you guys are just like want to be here 100%. <laughs> yeah, so definitely I think CTEC is a huge adva advantage for our students. Um, I know I wish that everybody could do something like what we do here. Um, I know like when we started filling out applications for CTEC at Cosmetology, there was a 20% acceptance rate. So mm -hmm. I was really, really grateful to be accepted into this program. Um, some, some students at our school, I've had a lot of friends who were actually dropouts and they had a very hard time you know, locating what they wanted to do in life. But at CTEC, it's just like everybody has a goal. Everyone has a dream. Everybody has something that they want to do. And I think that's what's really special. And the fact that everything that we do here is free is even more um, special. It's a great benefit for students who live in poverty because it's very difficult to have a free education here in America. So. Yeah, I think CTEC is just a really beautiful program, and it can bring a lot of gifts to people, especially our students here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think, especially with the professional skills that we learn here at CTEC, that's definitely a huge, massive step through the door of the um, just the career, uh, the career world out there. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, like I mentioned before in my in my speech about um, professional skills, that resume writing, that mock interviews, yes, that is offered at our home schools, but not like how it's offered here at CTIC. Like just that whole English, like hour of learning how to do that, uh, that resume really highlighting the keys that businesses want to find. Like we've learned some little uh, nicks and tricks to get through the system, and we're like, okay, <laughs> we really have a big advantage, and I feel like. As CTEC students, we're like, okay, like, yeah, we have a big advantage, but we also want to see our friends, like, do good at school, too. So I think the good thing is that half of the time we're here at CTEC and the other half of the time we're encouraging our, our friends at our home schools and telling them, yeah, we might have this advantage over here, but you guys are going to do great, too. And if you guys take the opportunities that are offered at our school as well, you guys will get that, too. But yeah, CTEC definitely big, huge footstep through the door. <laughs> it's a great message. Noah, did you want to share too? Yeah. I was just going to say that um, I personally feel that we do have an advantage here at CTEC. Um, for me personally, I feel like I've been offered a lot more opportunities than I would have been offered at my resident high school. I also feel like, like they were saying, we teach, they teach 
professionalism here. And for me, that carries over on into my resident school because I use the same um, techniques to stay on top of what I'm doing on top of the school outside of CTEC. Nice, thank you. Director Bethel, you had a question? I, did, I do actually have a question for the superintendent. Uh, and it kind of goes along with doc, what Dr. Shonda Geary was saying. And I'm really familiar with the CTE programs mm -hmm. across the district. Mm -hmm. Has the district yet began allowing students to maintain homeschool residency but transfer to a different comprehensive high school to access CTE programs? Yeah, no, we have not done that yet. Is that ever going to occur? Is that going to be, is that a vision and an opportunity? Because we hear about these profound opportunities mm -hmm. and we know, I mean, I've been with CTEC since the beginning. Every student that's crossed through the pathway here mm -hmm. has been successful in some way. And if we want to duplicate that with, with, in reduced cost, I would think that we as a district, as a school board, should definitely look at the fact that there are 53 other programs mm -hmm. that are available in our comprehensive high schools that are limited access because of a home school rule. Right. And I think that that's a barrier that should be overcome. Yeah. So, I, and I, I, can't, I can't talk enough about like McNary's geometry and construction. Mm -hmm. Yep. Huge program, the new diesel mechanic. Every high school has something similar to what CTEC has. It's just as great, but it has limitations of access. Where CTEC doesn't have the same limitations, it only has capacity limitations, which I think yeah. is the only downfall I can think of for this program yeah. because overall, like I said, it's profound. And yeah. it got better when we got here. And the uh, transportation to get people here and to get kids here because that's been another right. um, barrier to transport, <coughs> transfer between home, between high schools. Yeah. Can, can you, can you uh, share about what the transportation looks like? I was curious about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, you bet. Um, yeah. Well, it was really important that everyone had the opportunity to access CTEC and we didn't want to uninvite people who didn't have their driver's license or didn't have a car available. So what we do is we start our school day just a little bit later and we end our school day just a little bit earlier. So um, at North Salem High School, all the North Salem buses converge on North, and then one shuttle bus brings my North Salem kids to me. And then we cut down a little bit earlier at the end of the day, and that shuttle bus takes students back so that they can access their bus home. Chair, just to follow up on this uh, transportation, is that the only structural barrier that prevents the remaining 9,000 kids from attending? Or are there any other policy structural barriers that prevent others from availing the facility, just like the homeschool rule or any other capacity? Be barriers? Before we answer that question, um, let, let's, let's try to stick to questions right now with the students, if there's no more, so we can <coughs> release them and have them go home. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that Director Hyde had her hand raised. Oh, I she was there. Okay, who was that? Director Hyen? Okay. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. No problem. No problem. Okay. Uh, Director Hyen, your question? Uh, thank you. And actually, my question is for the superintendent, so uh, I will wait. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Any other questions for, for pre uh, Principal uh, Rhonda or the students? Um, I'll, I'll, oh, did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I would just like to hear from Gia Noah and Osvaldo on is, is there anything like any questions or any foods or nuggets of thought that you would like us to consider um, as you are in first year, second year here and think about many other students coming this way. So I, I'd just like to think, um, to hear if you have anything else that you'd like to share before taking off. Um, okay, so, well, as we already know, CTEC is just a really great program overall. Um, something that I do want to kind of bring up is that I, I wish that, you know, students who, I guess, who are at our home schools, I wish, you know, they could learn more about CTEC. I, I don't know why, but when I talk to my friends at my home school, a lot of them don't really know about CTEC as well as I thought they did. You know, a lot of them don't know about the programs that we offer and, you know, how it can take you farther than what you think you could have done once you graduate high school. Um, because at your home school, I, there's a lot of electives that you can take, but I think with CTEC, you know, a lot of students, they just don't really know what kind of programs we could give to them. And I feel like um, if CTEC was a little bit better about, you know, distributing information, I think um, could bring even more students here that could bring out more in CTEC and become 
even more successful. Thank you. I'd probably say that, uh, like just by me being here for two years and seeing how amazing this is, and knowing that there's 51, 52? 52. Other programs, I'm like, wow, <laughs> like it would be so great if like somewhere in the near future, CTEC could like expand and maybe add some of those programs. I feel like the <laughs> what the students are yeah. doing here, it's so amazing. And it's like, I wish that there was other programs that we could bring to CTEC. Obviously it would be like something that would need to be funded. And we'd also have like, I feel like, I mean, we're, what part of Salem? We're like kind of close to like entering Salem. Like it'd be kind of cool if like in the, not near future, I know this took seven years, like just itself, but if hopefully one day CTEC could be like maybe two CTECs <laughs> or just <laughs> it'd be something that really grows in our programs. I think that'd be an amazing opportunity and something I didn't touch before that um, Gia kind of touched on. It was uh, how it's amazing that we're, we won't be as, we won't have as much debt coming out of CTEC as other students. Mm -hmm. I know if it wasn't for CTEC, I'd probably be relying on my scholarships to do something like this. And if I didn't have an, the money to do it, I probably wouldn't do it. And I think just that free education here is amazing. I mean, like the amount of money that it costs to go to like construction school or like welding and stuff is just, is just crazy. <laughs> and being able to get it here free, it just opens so much opportunities. If more students can get that, that'd be so much more amazing. Cause I feel like since students don't have the ability to pay for it, that's why they don't do it, or that's why they don't get their dream job. And I feel like everybody should have that opportunity. At least everybody here at CTEC does. And hopefully, if CTEC were to expand, a lot more students would have it too. Thank you. I just wanted to touch off and kind of agree with um, Gia that, um, like, at my resident school, I feel like there's a lot of students who don't really understand what CTEC is. And, um, they don't really fully understand what it has to offer, so they kind of overlooked it, and I feel like um, CTEC's just a really, really good opportunity that people need to look at. Yeah, thank you, and uh, both of you who go to West Salem High School, uh, that's in my zone, and also my son's a freshman there, and he helps, he has hopes to come to CTEC, so if you guys can find out who he is, and <laughs> encourage him, give him tips, how to prepare his application, and, and be part of your CTEC family. <laughs> um, well, to close us out, just um, to touch on what you shared about the feeling of hope and unity, I think uh, when students come from all over our cities, it's kind of a level playing field where everyone has to meet and make new friends um, because each student only knows a few people who are already in the program, and then they're bonded by their common passion. Um, if you walk into our auto body shop, every single one of those students, no matter where they come from, is crazy about cars. Um, and that somehow just works and uh, they find each other and they develop really meaningful relationships So it does feel hopeful um, and unified. So thanks for that observation. You are the hope for our nation This model if we can scale it up will solve a lot of problems. I believe Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much Before you let them go, can I ask what age, uh, what grade level you first introduce people to CTEC? Like elementary kids get to know about it or middle <coughs> school or how do you prepare yeah. the pathway, pipeline to CTEC? Uh, we do tours and events for elementary and middle school students. Uh, and then in 10th grade in a normal year, and these students, their class, they didn't get a normal year. Um, they didn't get our normal recruitment process. So their classmates are less likely to be aware of the opportunities at CTEC. In a typical year, uh, we talk to all 10th graders in a given school. We invite them all onto our campus and they spend an hour and a half. They spend 30 minutes in the three programs that interest them most. And they literally get to experience it. They get to put on a welding hood and lay down a weld. Um, they get to cook something in our culinary kitchen and it lets them know this is for me or this is not for me. And that's, that's our normal recruitment process. And, you know, it hurt me a little bit when these, 
when these mm -hmm. students said our, our classmates weren't aware because we weren't able to do our normal recruitment mm -hmm. steps. And I'm sad that, that their classmates didn't know about the opportunities. Um, but that's our, our typical process. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to turn it over to um, Mike Wolf, our Chief Operations Officer, who is probably feeling like, wow, do I have to follow that? That's exactly what I'm Thank feeling. You. Uh -huh. Yeah. That is a tough act to follow. Nice work. Nice work. You got this, Mike. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, it sounds like we need to build up, right? Yeah. We got to figure out a way to add some more square yep. footage. Because the site is eight acres and it's not growing any bigger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, so um, good evening, Chair Avila, Superintendent, members of the board. So I have two rather boring topics to talk about, very technical. Uh, and after that uh, presentation and, um, th and with the kids, uh, I'm going to properly sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. So I have other friends that are going to help me talk through some of the details here. Uh, people who have been involved in this from the very beginning, and that would be uh, Mr. Dacopoulos, Superintendent Perry. Lynn Green is on um, the line as well. He's our environmental consultant. And so I wanted to, are we doing any slides or? Yeah, you've got, you should have a clicker unless Rhonda took the clicker. There you go. <laughs> I haven't used one of these for so long. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there you go. There we go. So we're talking about a donation. So this slide from concept to reality, you actually got a full dose of that already. Um, I will say, um, first of all, Rhonda, you're excellent at the podium. So nice work. Uh, you covered a lot of the, the detail here um, in a much better way. But I do want to take you back just a little bit further than just 2014. Um, this was the idea of a technical high school, an alternative high school, had been floated for a long time in this district, long, long before I got here. In fact, it was a discussion as a, in a lead up to the 2008 bond, um, and it, it went something like this. Wouldn't it be great to have a structure that was totally dedicated to everything Rhonda talked about? And at that time, there were some rough numbers that were thrown around that it could be upwards of $70 million investment. And that was back in 2008. And we know that everything costs more now. So the fact that we're here, that you're here in a $145,000 or 145,000 square foot <coughs> building that is valued at over 20 million and has 10 of the CTE programs, and Melissa will be talking about the community transition program, which is the phenomenal capstone for this facility, is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you, you talk about ROI, I don't think you could have found a better investment um, for this community. So that was part of it. Um, I, think, I just think it's super important for y'all to know that because you are at the end of a journey that many started before you. And the commitment that previous boards have made to get to this point um, allowed you all to make the decision um, that you'll be facing in October, hopefully. So with that, um, if you pull out your um, one of the handouts that has uh, the work session uh, September 28th, 2021 on it, it's about a seven page document. Uh, I'm assuming that everyone had a chance to at least scan it, and so um, just want to let you know straight up that I'm not going to go through it page by page. We're not doing a page turn here, uh, but I will scan it for you, and if you have any questions along the way, I have my team with me that I just uh, introduced, and we'll, we'll be happy to take whatever questions you have because it's super important for you to be comfortable when you're faced with the decision next month, okay? So uh, again, uh, as we talked about, this started in um, 2013 around this particular project, and that was with Mountain West uh, Investment Corporation approached the district with a, a public-private partnership concept. And as Paul can attest, um, trying to work out a concept in the boardroom is not the easiest thing <laughs> to do. <laughs> just saying um, but we did it uh, uh, your predecessors did it and um, really worked through a lot of the details because this was an experiment no one had done it before there was no blueprint 
we actually had to, and you can see by the detail that Paul and his team put together in this document, um, we, there was a lot of hope, but there was also, <laughs> let's make sure that nobody gets financially harmed in this experiment. And so you can see there was a lot of liability language and there was also a lot of language around how do we really engage the private sector so that they're true partners in developing out each of the programs. And you got a beautiful rundown of how that was envisioned with two programs a year. Um, over a five-year period, and we stuck to that schedule. Religiously, we stuck to that schedule because we knew um, that uh, kids' lives counted on it, right? And so um, there was a lot of marketing. There was a lot of pressure to make sure we opened up in the fall every year for five years, actually six years, uh, with CTP. So that gives you kind of a flavor of where we were, and, and I w would be remiss in this conversation to not um, bring up a few names from the past. Um, Superintendent Husk was also instrumental in moving this forward, and Assistant Superintendent Salam Noor was also instrumental in keeping this going, because I can tell you there were some conversations where we were sitting around <coughs> the uh, exec table asking ourselves, Is this, was this really doable back then? And, uh, and of course the answer is yes, <laughs> in case anyone was interested. Um, so if, if you move to the next page, um, then you can see where the sequence starts to flow as far as what Mountain West started to do. And so we had the uh, memorandum of, um, of understanding or agreement um, that was a sort of a, a pivotal piece of work at the board level. Then we had to get in and work it through the actual details of the lease and, and what that would entail, right? And I, I will get into the environmental work that happens simultaneously. Paul. Just one note, you'll see exhibit numbers in your packet. There's hundreds of pages of exhibits and I have um, a binder of all of those. Um, I mean, one exhibit toward the end is 1,050 pages. So um, the source documents are here. Um, this is just the summary. So th that's where the exhibits are, is in a notebook like this. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and, uh, and we can thank Lynn for the 1,000-page exhibit, because <laughs> he's the one that put that one together. Um, so, so needless to say, uh, we have all the detail that you could ever want to see, and uh, we're happy to share it, and Paul can walk you through it. Not tonight, but um, <laughs> it, offline, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Not tonight. Um, so again, starting with page two, you see the sequence of events where we, we moved into um, the uh, Mountain West acquired the, the uh, purchased the buildings, and then they had a ground lease from uh, Suntech Corporation, or LLC, which were, was the Nielsen Manufacturing um, Trust. So what we had was we had an entity that owned the land and we had an entity that owned the buildings. And that's what made it a little more complicated over the years as we worked through this entire process, as you might imagine, which fast forward to the donation agreements that are actually going to be part of the decision process, you'll be receiving two as a board, one from SunTech donating the land and one from, not Mountain West at this point, but it's CRTC Tech and again, we can talk about, Paul can do a much better job of describing how the entities have shifted over the years, still connected to the parent uh, organization, which is Mountain West. So you'll receive two donation agreements, one for the land and one for the buildings and all the improvements. Okay. Uh, we actually started the lease agreement in uh, 2015. You'll see that that's near the bottom of page two. It was a seven-year uh, lease agreement. And essentially what we did, and you'll see this on page three, uh, you can see the sequence of the changes to the lease are tied to the next two programs coming online. So for instance, uh, if there's uh, two programs and, and that encompassed 20,000 additional square feet, then the lease amendment would be for the 20,000 additional square feet. The rest of the building wasn't leased by us, that was still uh, owned by Mountain West, and as Rhonda remembers, there used to be an indoor soccer uh, field in part of the building. I must say, before this all started, I wish we would have had pictures. We, sh we do somewhere. Do we, we should find them, because over in the cafeteria area, the common area, and most of the building, um, 
were stored beans, right? And so <laughs> there's pictures of cherries. Pallets, and pallets cherries. of produce, of produce. <laughs> right? Canned from, and I mean from floor to ceiling. I mean, it was <laughs> awesome to see. They're no longer here, um, but that's what, <laughs> that's what was going on as we were building program spaces. So again, it was quite a unique experience throughout the years. But the point is the lease modified was modified every year with another addendum uh, to take into account the additional score footage required for those programs as they came online. And it, it led us to ultimately um, landing, as Rhonda said, with about 145,666 square feet of usable space. And that encompasses the entire structure now. And even though this looks like one structure, it, it was a, a few structures that we had to integrate um, as we built out. And the build out, the, the real deal was Mountain West would build out the space and equip it. We would provide the programming and the staff. The, the business partners would come in and make sure that we had all of the connections that we need, as Rhonda said, and the donation process continues. Right, and so we're on the hook to uh, replace the equipment as a district. That was that's part of the how you sustain uh, the operations. So that's kind of where we are. Um, I also, uh, this was a labor of love for others in the community as well. Like for instance, um, Governor Brown is. Uh, this was a very uh, high vis uh, industry uh, public private partnership as well. In the Oregon Business Development Department, OBDD, um, was a, a grant through uh, their department that helped finish out the last uh, couple programs here. So you can see a $900,000 grant. Now that grant was, uh, we, we were a pass-through entity for the construction uh, that Mountain West conducted. So again, <coughs> something that we had never done before, but it, it was absolutely part of the agreement and part of the partnership. I would say um, Chuck Lee was a master at fundraising as well. Mm -hmm. And um, the Oregon legislature allocated a million dollars to this project as well. Uh, and OBDD or the Regional Solutions Group uh, provided us with um, a lot of the money that we were able to have Lynn uh, do the environmental work for us. And I think to the tune of close to $100,000 to get that project uh, moving on the environmental side. So lots of people looking at this throughout the years as we move forward. And um, I also wanna call your attention, if you flip to the next page, which would be page five, but at the beginning of it, it says the cost of phase 5A. And if you pull out your, this color uh, schematic of the, of the layout of the building, it should look something like this. You'll see on the right side, um, we, didn't, uh, we don't actually have the up-to-date version of this. This is the latest one we have, um, but we did modify it a bit. You see um, the phase five was the last of the five of the build-out, right? There's actually a phase 5A, and that's important to the lease because phase 5A was the build out necessary to include the community transition programs that you're gonna hear from um, Melissa here in a second. So while we were leasing the space for a dollar a year, we were also paying all the operational costs of what we were leasing, right? So it wasn't just a dollar, uh, the costs of the operations increased every year. But for the CTP build out, um, that was about a million dollar build out. And so we entered into, we modified the lease, and that's kind of the last modification that you'll see in the document, where um, we would pay that back, that construction cost, over a five-year period. So our, our lease amount went from a dollar a month to about 16,667,000 a month, of which uh, we still owe, as of September, about 750,000, right? And so part of the donation, when that happens, we, in our lease, we have, a, we have an agreement to pay off the rest of whatever we owe. We have a, a timeline to do that, but I want you to know about the financial implications of accepting the donation, that we'll, we'll be paying off the rest of 
the uncovered cost uh, for the for the build out. Any questions about that one before I move on? I don't have any questions. I just want to point out that it's a really good deal. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, the whole thing is, by the Still, way. Yeah. even if we had to pay $750,000, it's a really good deal. It is, And yeah. to add our community transition programs yeah. was really important at the time. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, Mike, this isn't for you. I was hoping to ask this as soon as the students were done and, and before you got started. Uh, I had indicated I had a question for the superintendent. Uh, so related to the students, how do we decide who gets accepted in uh, to the various programs? And in a normal year, since this has been weird uh, with students not knowing about the programs, is there usually a waiting list? I'm, I'm happy to turn that over to Rhonda. Come on up. Well, I like our students' ideas of just expanding because I wish we could let everyone in. Um, but it's really hard. I'll use cosmetology as my example because it's the one for which I get the most applications, um, often about four times as many applications as spots. And um, we really want to make selections not based on things like GPA and test scores, but based on the trajectory of a young person's future. So when they apply, we ask them their career goals and it's really difficult to make these decisions, but when we ask students their career goals, uh, if a student is a 2.0, you know, sport in a C minus average, but their goal is to get their license in hair design, um, to work in a salon, and that is their future and their career path, uh, then they're gonna score very well on our rubric. Um, if a student uh, is a 4.0 student, but they just would rather paint fingernails than take a different class at their school, and they wanna become a veterinarian, that's gonna score lower on our rubric. So we really look at the needs students have for their own future, and we try to fill our program seats first with the students who are going to use that um, to build their lives. And so do we have waiting lists then? Uh, we do, um, we do. Cosmetology has a waiting list every year. It's smaller this year because as much as we tried to get the word out when we couldn't get students here on our campus, uh, we weren't as successful, but we do have waiting lists. Um, and we do try to extend that opportunity to as many students as possible. So if someone drops, we, we call someone and we get them in as quickly as we can. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that I had a great career from a technical education. Unfortunately, I had to pay for mine. Right. But um, I, I love that we're able to provide this uh, for the students in our district. Yes, me too. I think it means the world to them. Thank you. So um, I would uh, offer this uh, up to Paul. Paul, is there anything um, that you'd like the board to know regarding the sequence of the leases and the MOU? Um, thank you for, for that. I, for, um, I, I want to say that so much of this was based on trust. And Mountain West is such a true community partner it's not like they dropped into this in 2013 they have a proven track record of community involvement and um, our superintendents along the way and particularly uh, superintendent Perry has developed relationships with Mountain West as has uh, Mr. Wolf and so when it looked like it was the hardest going it was, it was the human trust that worked because each, each party in this was giving and trusting the others. It was a, a reciprocal relationship and it still is. Uh, so I'll say that. Uh, number two, um, there's been lots of lawyers involved. <laughs> um, I, 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 I listed them uh, at, uh, at the near the back of this document. Um, I've been involved since 2013 and did virtually all of the work for the school district. Mike Keene is back here. Um, you gotta be on the microphone. Mike Keene is a lawyer at Garrett Heeman Robertson and he's responsible for, for all real estate and business type issues for, for the school district. And so 
um, he would be able to address trans the transactional issues going forward. We have a whole section here on what needs to happen and what has happened to get us to a point that the school board can, can accept donations. So any transactional issues that are current, Mike Keene can answer those. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to work on this project. And I think you've hit all the major points. If okay. anyone has any questions about all of the acronyms that you see, there's a lot of um, limited liability companies that, that have been involved, but they all uh, tie back to the Mountain West Investment Corporation being the sole member um, uh, of, of that LLC. So uh, happy to talk about the minutia, but maybe better to leave that for another day. Hearing no request for minutia. Uh. <laughs> I do actually have a question. Okay. So uh, I don't, there, I wish there was page numbers on this, but it looks like it's the second to last page at the bottom. Number 11 talks about the EES. And I know that when I came on the board at first, we talked, you, you mentioned the, the thousand page document, the environmental study, which is an, a critical component to the risk and liability that the district will take on in the transaction of this donation. And so I guess, are you going to talk about that at some point tonight? Mm -hmm. That's and the next conversation. Okay. And when you do, can you talk about the groundwater mm -hmm. and some of the challenges that, I mean, by no means am I discouraging this transa transaction to occur, but I think it's important that the current, the new board members understand mm -hmm. the depth of some of the challenges that this property faces. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, that's the perfect transition. Thank you. To the, to the next uh, slide. And... Um, will uh, Lynn Green will be um, will be transitioning to Lynn's expertise on this one. Um, I will say that um, part of uh, well hang on I have a, I always like to have one of these to bring to a meeting you have, you have this handout in your yeah, and you're gonna have to go back to the <coughs> microphone thank you. Thank you. you have this handout in your uh, packet, mm -hmm. but it might be hard to see all of the dozens and dozens of boring holes uh, <laughs> that go at various depths, uh, both on the property and off the property, to address the uh, contamination that is part of the site. So I'm going to leave this in front of the podium for effect. Okay. <laughs> so um, the next phase is really talking about our level of due diligence. Uh, because while all of the conversations that you've already heard about how we were building out the programs, right, two per year, marching through uh, lease amendments, we were also drilling all these holes uh, and testing water and um, developing a contaminated media management plan, which is not new to the district. Um, part of one of the one of the grants that we received from the Regional Solutions is called a Brownfields Grant because this, by definition, is a brownfield site, which means previous industrial, that is being repurposed. And so lots and lots of support statewide for this effort because bringing this site back into its useful and highest use was super important for the community. It's also super important for the state as well. So that's part of the due diligence that we've gone through. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the uh, environmental phases that we've gone through. And if you can follow along with this document that you'll see with the header um, Everin Northwest, and that's the consulting firm that uh, Lynn is a part of. And Lynn's been a great partner along the way too. I mean, we, um, Christy and I and Lynn briefed mm -hmm. up uh, CTEC staff the first day basically mm -hmm. of opening because um, when you hear things like hexavalent chromium mm -hmm. you wonder whoa what could that mean right um, you know images of Aaron Brockovich uh, come to <laughs> mind which this is not that by the way uh, but we need to talk it through so you understand why it's not that and that's part of what this document does it takes you back uh, from, 
you know, from 1957 to about uh, 2005, where this was a manufacturing site. Um, and part of the, the manufacturing um, that happened here, uh, there was a lot of uh, paint and solvent waste, uh, photo, uh, photographic processing, printing, uh, plate shop areas, paint booth, chromate conversion, automobile wrecking yard, underground storage uh, tanks, right? This was your classic uh, industrial section of town. You know, it still is to some degree, right? It's being uh, redeveloped and, and, uh, and the city's working hard to do that, but that, therein lies the Brownfields approach, right? Is to, is to reclaim it. And so when you, you enter into, um, well, like if we were bringing um, a purchase, a land purchase to you, we as a district, part of our due diligence is to do the environmental phase one which is, and Lynn, jump in at any time. You're, you're part of this conversation. You don't need to be invited. Uh, uh, if I'm saying something or straying, um, pull me back. Yeah. Would, it, would it be good to put the PowerPoint down so we can see Lynn? Sure, or, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Lynn, are you ready to be seen? Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's enthusiasm. There he is. Hey, Lynn. Hey, Lynn. <laughs> hey, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah. So, Lynn, I'm just going through um, sort of the due diligence overview where um, we would do, we would have a phase one um, assessment done, and that's really uh, sort of the research, you know, sort of the document research to get a sense of the history of, of the property. And that can tell you things like, hey, it used to be a, uh, uh, automobile wrecking yard and there's um, you know underground storage tanks and then that leads to the next level in, of investigation and I'm oversimplifying this a ton I know Lynn so jump in um, but that next level of investigation is what uh, drove the next several years and all the holes in the ground and so Lynn um, could you give us sort of a you know 30,000 foot flyover of why you drilled so many holes in our property <laughs> Um, so starting in, I started working on this project in 2014, and at that time, uh, DEQ also got involved with the project. They provided oversight for the project the entire time, so a lot of the investigation that was done was you know, not only at our direction, but also at DEQ's direction. Um, they oversaw all the work. And during that time, for about four years, we cited numerous borings, collected soil, and groundwater samples, not at all locations, but at uh, many locations. And also during that time, we installed a groundwater monitoring well network that consisted of three uh, monitoring wells in the shallow water bearing unit. Um, and all of this was to get an idea of the magnitude and extent, you know, how bad is it and how extensive is it on the property. Um, and then also during that same time, uh, the school district requested that we perform a risk assessment since there's students on the site to determine whether or not there's potential exposure to a student. Um, in doing this risk assessment for the student, what we did is even though it's only a two-year program and it's only um, limited in terms of hours of day that they're on site, we assumed six years of exposure, 250 days a year that they would be exposed and it's eight hours each day. So it was a very conservative risk assessment. What we found is that the concentration so that they'd have to be exposed to that would potentially um, cause a risk from that exposure was almost an order of magnitude higher than what the concentrations in soil were at the site. And so, um, you know, based on that and knowing that the area of impact was underneath the building, um, the attention really turned to groundwater and the extent of groundwater. And a lot of that was driven by um, DEQ oversight as well as um, Salem Kaiser, or excuse me, City of Kaiser um, water supply system. And so um, one of the complicating things about hexavalent chromium is chromium is a metal, so it exists in, and I don't want to get too technical, but it, it exists in a couple different valence states. Um, you have chromium-3, which is actually a mineral supplement that you might take you know, as a vitamin, um, and then you have hexavalent chromium, which is actually pretty toxic. But in the environment, they both exist. It's just um, ge geochemical parameters will kind of push the equilibrium one direction or another, another favoring the formation of either trivalent or hexavalent. And so the state knows this, we knew this, you know, the different water purveyors know this as well. So the big question is, is, is the groundwater impact what's called um, enriched? In other words, is it been 
uh, anthropogenically enriched at concentrations above what you would expect for background concentrations. So we had the marching lot network on site as well as um, dozens of borings from groundwater. And then also we went off site and cited um, several borings off site and collected um, groundwater samples from multiple um, depths to determine potential impact to the aquifer. And what we found is that um, if the groundwater has been um, enriched on the site, it's only localized basically um, just proximate to the building location and that there was no enrichment offsite of the property at all. And so based on um, the information that we had on risk, based on the distribution of groundwater and based on the locality being fairly limited in soil, um, the state accepted um, no further action in terms of investigation warranted um, because of that data um, under a certain set of conditions that would be outlined in this easement equitable servitude that Mike was talking about. And I don't know, Mike, if you want me to go through what those um, conditions were in the ES or if that was something you were going to do. Um, I can jump in on that one. Um, but before I do that, so we asked Lynn to, to do the calculations in the most conservative way, right? Um, because that's part of the due diligence process and we're a conservative group here. And so when he says, in fact, if you go to page three and you see the bullet at the top and then the sub bullet um, beneath that, you'll see in an effort to be conservative, risk modeling for exposure to surface soil assumed a student would be on site for a total of six years, which they're not, and be exposed to surface soil 250 days a year. Okay, so Lynn, can you give us a picture of what that would look like if you're exposed to surface soil for 250 days a year? Yeah, typically that's more of a commercial setting. You'd have to be um, on site the entire time in direct contact with that soil. And in this situation, the soil is actually underneath the building, so there is no direct contact with the soil. And the other thing that I didn't put in that bullet but another thing to be aware of is we also assumed eight hours each day of exposure. And so you would have to be on site for 250 days a year, eight hours a day being exposed to that soil. So that's how conservative we were in this um, determination. And that's in line with the state's guidance. Um, they don't have specific guidance for students. So we took it to an extreme in terms of trying to be um, very conservative. Okay. What about exposure to our, our staff teachers, educators who actually are, could be here yep. long, you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years? So, yeah, great question. It still comes yeah. back to there are no exposure paths. Keyword. Yeah, it, there are no exposure paths. Um, it's underneath concrete, it's underneath asphalt. There's, um, and in the contaminated media management plan, if they're like, say we're going to build up, right? Cause we're gonna add another 145,000 square feet here. Um, you may need to do some trenching pipes, utilities, that plan addresses that work and the only people who would be exposed to the media is the people doing the work, not staff. How'd I do, Lynn? Correct, yeah, the contaminated media management plan uh, manages that um, potential risk. Great work. And so um, the uh, easement and equitable servitude uh, language, and Paul can describe why it's that as wonky. I mean, that's really weird language, but um, it is what it is. It's got a legal uh, definition, but it's basically saying, um, if you look down at the lower sub bullets on page three, you'll see that um, this needs to be recorded with Marion County, right? So once we own the land, it will be part of the deed, right? It'll be part of the legal description for this property. And it basically tells us that um, you can't use the groundwater, which we don't use. Anyways, how are we doing? Doing good. Okay, great. Um, it, we're not gonna grow any food crops <laughs> here. We're, we're not doing it. You can see a little grassy patch as you come in. We're not growing anything but grass there. Um, and we don't have to cap it but our ultimate plan is to work towards that. Yes. I just had a question about, um, so have we not recorded it yet? Because it seems like the conditional letter is dependent on us doing the recording with the county. We can't record it until you accept the donation. 
Okay, so we're accepting so the donation. This, okay. So this is all sequenced according to how DEQ makes us do this. And Mike, Mike Keene can, can jump in on this because he's been in, in these various conversations, but the, the idea is DEQ uh, wants the donation accepted, the, we know what the NFA looks like, and then the equitable servitude would be uh, filed with the county. Mm -hmm. So, so um, part of where we are, and this is where when Paul said there have been a lot of lawyers involved, <laughs> that includes DOJ. Um, and so uh, the sequence is that um, the district accepts the donation and then we uh, work, then we, be, we become the recorded owner. And part of that recording is that we will have the ESS uh, and then the NFA will be issued to us. We have a commitment from DEQ that that will happen. So there's, um, there's no risk that they'll go, oh no, uh, we were just kidding. Um, so we're heading in that direction and that, that's actually part of the next steps that um, was at the end of my slide. But we're, we're there um, now in the conversation. So it's important to understand the sequence of events as Paul laid out. Is there any, it, it it just seems, I understand there's a lot of lawyers, uh, there's a lot of LLCs that have been established to make this all work, but why can't the board receive a letter or a determination from DEQ that there are acceptable risks, you know, acceptable risk levels are not exceeded without, I mean, prior to us making the decision. Like, I don't, I'm not quite following the logic of why we have to accept it before DEQ can give us that letter. Well, we do have a letter um, of July 27th, 2021, that's um, in Exhibit 26, that, that, and this is from DEQ, that talks about this, this property and its address to Mountain West and to uh, Mike Wolf. And that goes, and that talks about uh, the order that they require uh, in order for this all to work. And number one is the school district becomes the owner of the property. The school district will provide DEQ with documentation of ownership. Uh, number two, the school district and DEQ execute the easement and equitable servitudes. And then we, we have to record it and provide them with a copy. And that's when they issue the no further action determination of which we have a draft copy already. Uh, and and that's, that's their requirement. And the amount of time that Mike Keene has spent on the phone with DOJ and our own environmental attorney and Lynn Green um, to talk about how this how we are required to do this is is a lot of time. Mike, I don't know if you wanted. Uh, uh, I uh, thanks for providing this. this exhibit. I appreciate that, Paul. Just one. It, I mean, this letter that Mike just pre provided me, and we can take this offline. We don't need to get this far into the weeds right now. Um, it just it says right here that the school district prefers taking ownership prior to executing the easement. And, and equitable servitudes. Can you address that, Mike? Wh which Mike? Mike you got it? Uh, Keen. Well, and, and yeah, you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Well, I, we can't really speak to what, DO, what DEQ has said, but what DEQ is telling us is the, the reason we have to take ownership first is because only the owner can record it. We can't record that for somebody else. And there is a long list of items in the EES, the easement equitable servitude. Basically what that does is it translates everything from the no further action letter. It says you are bound to do these things in the no further action letter. And it records it against the property mm -hmm. so that it is known to the public, subsequent buyers, 50 years from now, everyone knows what has happened on the property and what the restrictions are. Because the way it used to work, as I understand it, is that they would just issue an NFA and then you would have to do a search through DEQ files to find it. 
and see what it says. And not everyone would do that. So this makes it real clear for all the world to see. And it makes it enforceable for subsequent owners. Okay. Thank you. Does that help? Um, I'll just follow up later. Okay. I, I still just don't quite understand the why. Like, why couldn't we have that recorded with the current deed and then we assume? But yeah, I, with the current owner recording it. Yeah, do it, it, it just doesn't. We, it, mm -hmm. To me, it's not logical, but I don't, I'm not understanding. <laughs> but also, we can talk oh, later. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't want to spend more time on it. So okay. thank okay. you. Yeah. And um, can I, Mike, Dr. Chenjigar has a question. Yes, go ahead. So we have been having kids here for so long. Has there been any reported case of problems uh, no. because of environmental exposure? No. No. The second thing is the current or the previous owner, let's say Mountain West or whatever this was used for, was stored for, for uh, some kind of fruit storage place, right? Well, it was Can't a manufacturing, manufacturing and thing. Then, once it, then there was food storage here, but they were in cans. Okay, so <laughs> is it because that now we have children and students, so it's a different due diligence is required? Is that the thinking That's behind why they need us to take ownership? I'm not entirely clear. Um, it's about use at the end of the day. Yeah. What is the purpose for which? Um, let me just say, a part of the, um, and, and this is why, the the public private partnership mm -hmm. has been built on trust and you know believing that each one will will fulfill um, their obligations um, SunTech their lease with Mountain West mm -hmm. and now with CRTC tech right <coughs> is for the land right SunTech owns the land mm -hmm. their condition is you accept the donation of the land as is. Mm. That's one of the, the, the basic tenets of this agreement. So that's why we drilled so many holes, and that's why we've done our due diligence for so many years, because we understand what as is means now in a big way. And so with that as a backdrop, working with DEQ, like Paul said, they've already crafted the NFA, which is, there's also another public process to get that approved, right? So DEQ, as a state partner, is ready to issue the NFA, but they have to issue it to the owner of the land, and that's where the EES comes in. And so to facilitate this transaction, um, we believe it's in the best interest of the district to receive the donation with the commitments we have from DEQ and all of the due diligence that we've done and then record the transaction as Paul has described. And during, so during the terms of the lease, we've been indemnified also, right, from any liability associated with the environmental contamination. And right. now we would not be, because we would be the owners. Right, like so that's through, the, since the beginning of this project, Mountain West has indemnified us for all pre-existing environmental mm -hmm. issues. And that's been in, that's continued through every lease. And, and when Mountain West then gave the, the building to CRT, CTEC, Community Resource Trust, CTEC, they agreed to indemnify CRT as well. So as we become the owner of the property, now we're responsible. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And that also, um, that's a really good segue into one of the reasons why, and you've heard Lynn say, and Lynn, you can say this um, in, in a different way, um, that we have, we have estimated the risk in a very conservative way. Um, there are no exposure pathways to the contamination. <coughs> and even so, and we've checked uh, to see if there's any migration of contamination into the water supply, and there is not. Um, but even so, um, Lynn and um, Jeffrey Titchener, who's an excellent environmental lawyer um, that we brought in, we brought in many experts over the years, uh, recommended that we purchase pollution liability insurance. So we have a 10-year term policy that will kick in as soon as we receive the donation and the NFA from DEQ, um, just as an added layer of protection. 
If I, I want to ask a quick question, if I heard it correctly. Um, the When DEQ, you said they have a public process for when they um, go before they give an NFA? Um, they receive comment. They Lynn, receive comment. Lynn, is there anything else you'd add to that? No, basically they um, produce what's called a staff letter, which is what um, the other attorney talked about a little while ago. And then they put that staff memo out on record um, for public comments so they can review the state's review of all the work that we've done, their interpretation and findings and their recommendation for closure. Yes, Grace. Uh, so, kids, I don't know if they can. Know. Yeah. Okay. So, could, because of the ground, can students grow plants? Like, could the ag program grow produce? No. No. No, okay. that's, that's one of the conditions in the EES or EES. Okay. So, yep. that's why they have the technology over there. Well, <laughs> I, but I don't, I think, but it states right here that they can't grow anything without DEQ approval. So, there's a process. There is a process. We don't want anyone growing anything here. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're going to cap yeah. that. That's okay. the. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, agree. I don't think. I don't yeah. know. Um, that the has, has the city done any any, any um, due diligence with run, with running it off? Because I'm reading here, and, and you know, you mentioned the city of Kaiser, 15 water supply wells. Has there been any? Um, recognition from the city of contamination running down these streams or underwater getting into these water wells that that's uh, some of the off-site uh, work that Lynn did Lynn you can speak to that yeah so um, from the very beginning when we were dealing with the city of Kaiser and the state of Oregon DEQ um, we looked and again what, what everybody needs to kind of remember is of chromium is present naturally occurring in groundwater systems and that depends on the geochemical state of the environment. So um, city of, of Kaiser has had detection of hexane chromium in several of their wells historically. So most uh, water purveyors in the state of Oregon because again it exists um, naturally in the environment. You know where the concern is is if it's potentially being enriched from some sort of uh, man-made source or anthropogenic source such as a release from a chromate conversion system like they had at this facility. And the investigation that we did immediately going off site showed that um, you know, there is an area of localized um, enrichment in soil right beneath the building where this old chromate conversion system was, but it's pretty laterally limited to just that area. And it's also vertically limited to that area. And the groundwater data suggests that you know, the higher groundwater concentrations, whether the background or related to that release, are also located, you know, proximate to the building. They don't extend off-site um, on adjacent properties, let alone uh, far enough to reach the city of Kaiser's wells. So uh, DEQ also agreed with that data and said it's very localized, and the likelihood of it impacting an off-site uh, resource, such as a water supply, are, are very low, you know, if at all. And so that's the reason why DEQ agreed to um, move towards closure. And there's no recommendations for additional treatment or anything like that on the property, other than keeping it capped, which is um, you know maintain all protective surfaces, and then from an exposure standpoint, implement the county media management plan. All right, thank you. And so on on that note of maintaining the cap, um, do we have like a plan for whenever it comes time to very, you know? to replace the asphalt to fix any cracks and then um, you mentioned the potential for building up any trenching <laughs> are we like going to close the school down then to try and mitigate the exposure um well that's a that's a great question it's it's kind of hypothetical um but what i would say is that's where the contaminated media management plan which is how do you manage the the hazardous material the contaminated media through the, the life of uh, the structure or the programs, um, the use of the building. So if we were to do anything at all, um, the CMMP would dictate the uh, means, methods, techniques, protocols, PPE, all that, all that stuff. Um, and so um, it would be an interesting project to build up. I'd love to be around to do that. I'm not going to be around. I think that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's possible Let, to build let's up do with it. this. Yeah. But to answer your question, it's all part of the protocols and protections in the CMMP on how to move forward. Okay. And, the, and just so you know, 
the soil is treated as contaminated material and it's taken to a hazmat site. Yeah. So if we did, let's say we did need to trench inside the building at some point, part of the, it might be that we would say, okay, we're going to have to trench in here. We are going to do this on the off um, summertime when there aren't kids in the building. And then again, every contractor has to follow the PPE, the requirements around what they wear, how they cordon off the area and all of that. Yeah. And I mean, like that might yeah. be like a question nope. further down the road mm -hmm. and in the weeds, but definitely interested in knowing like when we come to the decision that like repairing like the asphalt in the parking mm -hmm. lot because i mean like that's inevitable that is yep yep and the and the um the management plan dictates how we would do that and we couldn't do it without following the management plan right and that would be part of the contract with the, con uh, the construction company mm -hmm. is here's the cmmp and they're all very familiar with um, mm -hmm. managing through that Quick. Question. Director, Director Guzman. Um, I'm curious if, and this is just maybe just curiosity, um, do we know of comparable sites, for example, that have contamination that have been built on any, like, have mm -hmm. we researched that across either Oregon or the country? Mm -hmm. Because I understand, right, where there's the repurposing of the industrial land, which is, is going to continue to happen, especially as cities grow and expand. So I'm just curious if we've looked at other sites and what that possibly has looked like. Um, and just done any sort of comparison. Sure. Uh, Lynn is our resident expert and works through, you know, lots of these. But I will tell you, locally, uh, Chavez Elementary School was built on farmland, uh, and it was contaminated with uh, Dialprin, which um, is a, a pesticide. And so part of that CMMP and part of that project with DEQ was to put a 12-inch uh, topsoil cap on it because that's not chromium six that's something else and so they have different thresholds uh, for contamination and so uh, we have a cmp cmmp there as well and so um, if we don't dig there unless we need to and if we need to we follow the cmmp so we have a, we have a very real example in the district of one of our newest elementary schools as well yeah, and I can just add, um, I've been doing this for almost 30 years, and we have hundreds of sites that we do annual inspections as part of either a soil cap management compliance plan or something like that. And so they're very, particularly in industrial areas, that it's one of the easier ways for industry to kind of develop land that's been impacted is by just providing a cap over the top of it and do not disturb unless needed. And, and getting back to your question regarding like asphalt service and stuff like that, that's actually some of the more simpler um, surfaces to repair with the CMMP because typically you're not digging down into the soil, you're just going down to the subgrade, which is more of the aggregate. Um, and so really part of the cap is just to maintain that surface so it doesn't become you know, something that water can get through or something like that or lead to um, the loss of that covering through degradation or something like that. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, my, uh, our piece around the due diligence and the technical aspects, including the MOU and lease, and then the environmental work um, is included in um, your handouts. And also, Paul has, Paul, I apologize, we should have gone over the fact that we do have detailed binders uh, that are available for your review. And, um, and we'd certainly encourage you to, to do that if you have questions. No, I really appreciate the the summary um, that you just went over. You know, got to read it ahead of time, and it I feel confident in the work that has been put into this from all the parties, um, the discussions from the lawyers, um, even from the surveys, and um, I feel really good. But I do ask the other uh, board directors if they have further questions uh, throughout the week um, to please email uh, e email them to Alice, and then she can email everybody and. Um, or if they're directly to Paul to, to CC board leadership as well on that. Um, but I think, thank you very much. I, I, feel, I feel really good about this and looking forward to next month if there's no other questions. And just to recap then, next month will be the first reading. Yeah, we put, um, we put this on 
um, just as a, we do have it on as a first reading after the report is finished. Tonight? Tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So we'll go through the CTP and then we'll come, have you come back up for the first reading, walk them through the document, and then we'll um, bring it on for a second reading in October. Perfect. Unless there's a lot of questions and we need more time. And can I ask Paul DeCopolis, is there a binder for every board member if they want it or do you just have a couple? I have five. Uh, I have five of these. Okay, so if somebody uh, wants to take it. If someone wants to take mm -hmm. it, uh, okay. that would be fine. Enjoy your reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, one more question. Yeah, it looks like Dr. Chen agree. Is there a timeline by when we need to kind of uh, vote on this? Because uh, uh, sometimes when people are donating, they also mm -hmm. want to kind of uh, close their books. Yep. Yes. Yep. That, that's a, that is a great question. Um, and the, I, I would have gone over that in the, in the reading, um, but I, I can say it again later, and that is, um, this isn't about me, but I made a promise to Superintendent Perry that we'd have this wrapped up before I retire. And, <laughs> and, and we were thinking that would be June, not December. So we're <laughs> that was and, the one condition I put on, was it? That was the only condition I put. Yeah, you will wrap up CTEC before yeah, you're finished. <laughs> kind of. But, but to your point, these donations do have tax consequences. Mm -hmm, that's so we would absolutely, I know the Nielsen's would appreciate this being wrapped up um, before December 31st, which means first reading tonight, action in October. And the action, the board plays for the action on these transactions. Basically, you make the decision. And then um, it base, it, the, the language of the decision um, delegates all the, the authority needed to complete the transaction to me. That's how it rolls. So can I ask a clarifying Here, question? question? Yes. Let me do a quick um, process. How about if we move into the first reading mm -hmm. uh, for the donation of the property so that we can open it up for discussion? about the, the donation document. Thank and then you. we'll close out um, with um, Melissa and our community transition programs at the end. Director Hyen, is that, a, is, is that okay? Or do you want to need to ask your question now? I, if you don't mind, I just wanted to harass Mike for a minute and say, um, I'm a, I'm, we'll vote no if we can keep you till June. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the intent. Okay, so. <laughs> If you don't mind, so today we'll have the first reading, so October, because I thought I heard you saying October will be the first reading. Yeah, so today will be the first yes. reading. T Thank you. Thank today, you. Today will, yeah. I think I misspoke on that one. Okay. All right. So let's move into the first reading of the donation of the building and land where the district operates CTEC. Mr. Wolf, if you would walk us through this donation agreement quickly. Sure. Let's start from the beginning. Oh, okay. Let's take a quick uh, five minute break. Okay. <laughs> so the time is, uh, let's be back here at 8.01. Thing is called. I'll call it a mini sledgehammer. Uh, a mallet. A mallet? A mallet. Uh, you go.
<laughs> Two hands. Two hands. <laughs> All right, we're back. Thank you, Mike. Do you want to start off with the first reading of the uh, donation of the building and land where district uh, operates CTEC? Yes, uh, good evening, Chair Avila, uh, Superintendent Perry, and members of the board. Uh, this evening is the first reading um, for the acceptance of the donation as described by the chair. Just to give you a little background, which you've already heard. <laughs> um, we, we've been operating this facility since uh, 2015 where we opened up two uh, of the first of 10 programs. We've finished the build out um, and we have now a, a complete operational facility of 10 CTE programs and a phenomenal new space for the location of three of our community transition <laughs> programs um, as well. The facility is um, over 145,000 square feet, close to eight acres of land, and is valued at over uh, $20 million currently. We know that CTEC uh, is a highly popular and innovative collection of programs. Uh, we also know that um, there's been extensive due diligence conducted over the years um, addressing environmental concerns uh, on site and we have finished uh, all of those investigations. Um, we have Everin uh, Northwest as our environmental consultant um, and he was able to, uh, Lynn Green was able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, there was also a series of uh, a memorandum of understanding that started the entire process and was updated recently to reflect the current situation um, with a complete build out. And we've had a series of leases that have followed the build out over the years. We are at a point um, where we're ready to accept the donation because we feel that the due diligence process has um, provided us with the assurances uh, that the district needs to accept the donations. And part of that is the DEQ process uh, that once the donations are accepted, one for the land and one for the buildings, that uh, we will then move through uh, their requirements uh, for the no further action uh, letter and determination that include the easements and uh, equitable servitudes as we've discussed. And those are the conditions upon which the DEQ has approved the no further action. And we'll record those as a property transaction upon acceptance of the donations. Again, just a reminder, this is a first reading and we'll come back to the board for action in, no, in October. With that, I would open it up for any questions. Yes, Director Bethel. Oh, I don't have oh Director Chenegar. Thank you, Chair Avila. <coughs> Mr. Wolf, I really appreciate this. Uh, you know, I just want to say this is an amazing, uh, uh, opportunity and I want to thank Mountain West and Mr. Takorsky and his vision for setting the stage for how truly public, private and every other stakeholders can work together. Because I truly believe this community and school and our future businesses of uh, the future of our country is sovereignty and security and economics and for us to it's really tied to schools. Public school is the place, and equity is the bread and butter of public education and public schools. And this is the best example I can see. I mean, you talk of 98 to 100% graduation. And uh, to me, this means if we can just find a way that all private sector can collaborate in a seamless manner with our public sector, public schools, and use such a template we can have the best equity possible. And my hope is we examine all the structural or policy or legal barriers to such a seamless collaboration. And hopefully the next time somebody else comes up, we don't wait 10 years and we can just make sure, okay, this is what we have learned. This is the vision set by Mr. Takarski and his group. And similarly, we can do with healthcare and other private sectors because that's the only way we can be having the future of our children and our nation preserved. So I am very thankful. Uh, it means a lot. To me, it's far more than $20 million. You know, you have a whole generation of uh, 
uh, students who have gone through this, and it's really allowed them not just to break free from their own challenges and you know poverty and other social adversities, but also close the gap over historic and generational gaps that some of our children or some of the families or vulnerable communities have. And to start thinking big and dreaming big, I wish this is the model that we can follow and we can start collaborating with other private public partnership in other areas as well. So thank you. That's what I wanted to say and hope as a board we can approve this. I would urge my fellow board members to have some trust in private sector, public sector model because this is the way we need to take care because schools alone cannot do it. One section of our uh, public system cannot do it. We are all seamlessly interrelated with each other. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Tendigary. Is there a question? Just a reminder to the board that this is a draft document that we see before you, so all the, the, the uh, bl blanks for dates and things will be uh, filled in. Mike Keene has just been working this week on finalizing some of the technical language, so there'll be two of these donation agreements for your consideration that will look like this. Is there any questions from any director? I, I don't actually have a question. I just want to say that one of the things that, uh, one, I think one of the, the priority components that we I haven't heard about today, and I'm sure it's just an oversight, is the CTEC Advisory Committee mm -hmm. that has worked hand in hand in partnership with the school district from the private perspective from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, there's there's countless names on this list that I'm sad to say we haven't had a, a luncheon in some time, obviously because of COVID, but they come to a space here to talk about how to continue to make this program and the programs surrounding it and in other CT classrooms in the comprehensive high schools be successful. And I, I, I hope that they can be invited um, to the board meeting you know, personally extend a, an invitation to come and watch this transa transaction occur. And I think they need to be thanked publicly because I think that although there is millions of dollars poured into this and Chuck and Kim and, and the team at Mountain West did monumental work to get us here. Um, I, I believe that Larry, uh, he leads uh, from, the, from behind really and every time we sit down with him and Dick Lipnell and the others that are on that panel of, of, of community experts, frankly, it took all of them uh, to get here. And it's going to take all of them to continue to make this program be the, the, the best it is in the country. Um, I'm actually a little sad to say uh, that Chuck Lee's uh, stories of traveling the country and sharing about what a model of success this is is not going to any longer happen. Maybe somebody else will do that for Mountain West, but um, I'm, I'm really proud of this, and I'm really proud of the work that Christy and, and Sandy, the visionary before, um, and yourself, Mike, have done to make, to, to, to make this happen. It's really, it's critical, and I'm, I'm really grateful, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bethel. Um, as as you, some of you may have heard, you know, the national recognition and, and the leadership from CTEC is, is gonna, the new program uh, from the Willamette ESD development is going to be modeled after CTEC in addition to another program. So, I just yeah. make one additional request. If you have questions, if you could get them to um, Alice like within about a week, she'll also send out a reminder so that, because um, I don't believe Mike is going to be able to be at the October board meeting, so that we can come prepped between Paul and his team as well um, to have questions answered ahead of time. If you need time with documents um, and need to have time with um, Mike or Paul or anyone with documents, we'll, we're happy to spend all that time with you ahead of the next board meeting. It is, um, it is important that we make the decision in October so the rest of the things can happen by the end of 2020. So. Okay. Thank all right. You. So a bit out of order here, but we are going to end with uh, Melissa Glover.
And um, Melissa's um, shared a few spotlights um, with you, um, but and last time around our Life Source uh, partnership, which was really showcasing one of our con community transition efforts around the business. So with that, um, Director Glover, <coughs> I'm gonna let you present about our community transition programs and uh, Dr. Udosnatov, you could put up the slides, please. Well, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share about the work that our kids and our staff do in these programs. Um, I wanna take just a minute that we just went through a lot of really technical language and I just wanna take a moment to honor our interpreters who <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sure had no idea what they were walking <laughs> into <yeah>. tonight. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, Nikki and Jason especially have spent all day with students helping interpret for them in classrooms so they could access their education and now they are here helping our deaf community be able to access this board meeting. So thank you Nikki and Jason, um, really and appreciate you. And, and, yep. and Cheryl for our Spanish interpretation as well. Just always appreciate you guys. I had trouble following that myself, so <laughs> kudos to you. Um, so thank you for being able to allow me to share tonight about our programs. It's one of my favorite topics in special education, um, talking about how we help transition our kids out of the public school system and into the world. So I'd love to, oh, I have a clicker. Um, how many of you are familiar with our community transition programs? So, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an amazing program that we have. And so I wanted to just um, take, a, take a few minutes tonight to make sure you just understood what they were. Know that they are highly individualized programs for students. So the complexity of them um, becomes really complicated when we get into the weeds <coughs> about what it looks like day to day. But there are some just general information pieces that I can share with you so that you can um, walk away tonight just understanding the services and supports that these programs offer. So our community transition program serves students with special education services. So you need to qualify for special education to access these programs. They are for students after high school. So we have a number of students that finish um, a high school with a different type of diploma. And so we have any student who receives special education services and completes with some other certificate, some other document other than that standard diploma is eligible for these services. I apologize, we're trying to make sure we can get our interpreter back on the screen. No problem. There you go. Um, and so what they are is students are eligible to continue receiving these services um, until the end of the year in which they turn 21. So it's often a three year program depending on the age of which they graduated high school. And on any given year, depending on how many students choose to access the program, because it is a choice program for students, we generally have somewhere between 150 and 170 students, um, usually in the 18 to 21 year old range. Um, we do have, I put, in the, I put in the bottom, this was actually designed by one of our high school special education programs, um, but we really talk about the community as our classroom. So we have locations that I'll talk just a little bit about, but the majority of the time that our students are in school during the school day, they're not actually in a classroom. So we spend a lot of time just out in the community working on their um, independent independent goals. So in a sort of in a nutshell, we have eight classrooms, we have eight teachers, uh, we have around 80 staff that support our students, um, and we have three sites where those eight classrooms are at. So on Chemeketa's campus, we have two classrooms. Um, on the Riverfront Learning Center classroom site, we have three classrooms, and then here at CTEC, uh, we also have three classrooms. And so um, the work that they do is very similar, um, but they're just different programs in different parts of our community and different numbers of students. So just know that the, the programs don't have different purposes, they just have different parts of the community where they're located. We have, and I'll, I, I always feel like the best way to try and explain our program is through pictures. So um, I tried to find some, we, have, we do have a Facebook page and there are a lot of pictures of the work that we do because that's sometimes when we're trying to explain to kids and families about this option. It's, it's complicated to explain what this might look like. So um, this is a picture, we had one classroom a few years ago that started working with the city of Salem on understanding um, just how to, how to work with the city and what are the different options and they ended up wanting to do the adopt a street program and so they adopted a street over by McKay High School. Um, so if you drive down, I think it's down to Hollywood Street, you see the adopted by MICA CTP program. Um, and that was something that the students chose to do because they were learning about the community. 
So when we talk about instruction in the CTP programs, regardless of which classroom you're in, we really have three sort of core instructional areas that we focus on. So vocational training and preparation, independent living, and then recreation and leisure. Um, and so, and I'll just give you some information about each of those here in a second, but those are our three sort of pillars, same as in a K-12 setting, we talk a lot about reading, writing, math. We in, in transition programs talk about vocation, independent living, and rec and leisure. A lot of the individualized instruction is based on their IEP goals. So within those core standards, we have a lot of other things happening as well, based on what the student's plan is for transitioning out of high school. Uh, but ultimately, our goal is to provide a seamless transition for our students into the hands of adult agencies if that's, what's, if that's the plan for them. So we work very closely um, with vocational rehabilitation services, with developmental disability services, with our local brokerages, and then with a number of different providers in the community who support our students in this handoff period of time into the world that they're going to enter. Um, and we do meet with these agencies weekly, usually, um, and we talk individual students and situations. We um, set up plans where we partner with maybe a job coach or a job developer, and we'll partner and take a student out into the community um, with one of our staff and with one of their staff so we can really start to see what does job development, what does um, preparation look like for that student. So the hope is that when they transition out of our program, sometimes it's at 21, sometimes it's sooner, if, if we were able to set something up sooner, um, but the hope is that there's a really seamless handoff and there's no gap in support um, from when they leave our school district. Uh, and this was, a, this was a visit we did a few years ago to the construction, there was a construction fair at the um, convention center and so we had a number of students go and we worked on practicing asking questions and what are the jobs you can do and um, just a really fun, a really fun day and so I, that was a great picture to share. Um, and so just real quickly, I said that those three areas of instruction that we really focus on, vocation, independent living, and uh, rec and leisure, I thought the best way to sort of talk about different experiences is through pictures. Um, and I have hundreds of them, literally. Um, it drives some of our staff crazy because I always share them. But um, these are some examples of just some of the things that we've done. We have right now about 80 business partners that help host um, various work sites, um, internships, and they're based on um, student transition assessments. So when students come to us, we do assessments with them, interviews with them. Um, what, do, what do you want to do? What do you like to do? Sometimes that's a really hard question even for an 18, 19 year old to answer. And so there are times where we do um, sort of a discovery process where we trial different things. We say, what did you like? What did you not like? Um, but ultimately our goal is to start training and supporting students in a pathway. Um, so a few different of our community partner settings, uh, you'll see we have a student on the left. He is working the landscaping crew with Chemeketa Community College, really liked working with his hands, wanted to be outside, really liked power tools and those sorts of things. And so we were able to partner with Chemeketa to teach him some of those um, skills. Hopefully our risk person isn't looking at them using a weed whacker. I don't even know if that's okay, but it was part of his IEP, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> The second picture, so we always seem to have students that say, I wanna work with animals, and they're not entirely sure what that means, they just know that that's a passion and a love, so we've got partnerships with Petco, we've got partnerships um, with a variety of different um, nonprofit organizations for animals. So here is a student who was learning um, grooming, <laughs> grooming of animals, and so um, that was really exciting when we started working with uh, Petco to be able to support that, because that's, that's a, not one that we have readily available in the district. So that's one where we really have to go out to our community um, and start, start carving and start developing. Um, and we have a saying with our staff that everyone's a job developer. So the moment we start to understand who our students are and what it is they want to experience, we're out there starting to figure out where we can find those opportunities for them. Uh, we have a student there at Roths um, working in the produce section. It's always fun to have them in the deli and all the different, with Safeway, Ross, we have a number of grocery store partners um, who, and we try to, we, the other thing we think about a lot is transportation for students. And so we try and work with partners and businesses that are close to homes or to close to bus lines. Most of our students rely heavily on city bus. Um, that's another part that we teach pretty heavily right from the first day they're there. And so it's, it's kind of about accessing there too, because our hope is that once we train and teach students in, in different areas, that they will become a desirable employee and then we just hope that the employer just hires them. Um, and we always say we're never sad to lose a work site because it usually means they've hired the student into that position and we lose a lot of work sites, which is great. 
Uh, and then the last student is there at Safeway, um, and he actually, this was his first paid position, so Safeway hired him um, right at the start of the pandemic to help monitor the ins and outs of the um, grocery store and to hand out masks, and um, he was working a lot of hours. He was pretty excited, um, and this was a student that, um, very near to my heart through his high school experience. We, we spent a lot of time together, and so I was glad when he chose to enroll in our programs, and he was pretty proud of himself with that, with that opportunity. Um, independent living is another area that's, that all of our students focus on and their goals are all a little different, um, but it depends on the student, so they, they spend a lot of time identifying their own goals. Um, some of the things that we do around independent living, we do a lot with cooking, we do a lot with just general self-care, um, laundry, some of those just general day-to-day -day things. Um, <laughs> we do a lot with the city bus and I know that's an area that uh, we have a lot of conversations with families about right at the start where we say we, we are going to be on a city bus because someday you're not going to want to drive them to work. It's just how it's going to go. Um, and so some of the experiences you can see here, we have a student on the left who we were um, teaching how to use a barbecue grill. He really wanted to learn to grill. Um, he said he saw his dad do it all the time and he wanted to learn it. And so uh, we set up a barbecue grill and benefited from his um, instructional experience because we all had burgers, but um, he came back to our office several times and we continued to teach and to say, okay, you're on your own, what would you do? How do you know if the burger's done? Um, a lot of those different skills around just general cooking. Um, student there on the top, he actually had his first paycheck. Uh, he was a student worker with our student, empl student employment program a few summers ago. So this was him taking his paycheck to the bank for the first time and understanding that concept of paycheck to cash. Um, and there were a series of pictures that his mom sent me with that one, um, including what he purchased with, the, with that money afterwards. <laughs> Um, students underneath, we spent a lot of time out in the community ordering, practicing things like grocery shopping, just some of those general skills. Um, we have shopping there, so there's students going out and going shopping and thinking about if I need to buy clothes, if I need to buy things for work, what do I do, how do I price it out, how, do, how does this work? Um, a lot of times students that experience disability have been told what to do as they grow up, and we spend a lot of time in our program saying, what do you think you need to do? What, what comes next? And it's amazing the things that we would think um, they would know what to say, and they don't always because they've spent the last 18 years with somebody saying, now go try that on, now try this, now do this. And we, we work really hard to um, create a level of self-determination with students so that they can make their own decisions. Um, and then the bottom picture is another student uh, down at our Riverfront campus who's working on um, cooking skills. So we spend a lot of time, if you're, if you're living on your own or semi-independently or whatever your goal is, um, how are you going to feed yourself? And so we, we do a lot with that as well as health and nutrition. And then the last uh, piece, which is always the most surprising, but um, definitely the most enjoyable, is um, when we think about our students that experience disability and when they leave the school district, I think our greatest concern is always, will they have things that they can do, right? So school is that place where kids build friendships, where they engage with other, other people their own age. And we wanna make sure that when they leave us, if it's a Saturday afternoon, they know how to call a friend and say, hey, do you wanna go bowling? You wanna go see a movie? And so while it looks um, sometimes on the outside like play, there's a very intentional scope and sequence to our instruction around this. and so. Um, students plan their, their trips, they do the budgeting for them, um, they get there oftentimes on their own, so sometimes we'll say, okay, what bus are you going to take? See ya, we'll meet you there. Um, and so there's a, a number of different things, and again, it's always based on student interest, student assessment, and so we've done some um, interesting adventures. Again, risk if you're listening, maybe close your ears. Um, <laughs> So we have, I mean, just some simple ones in our community, bowling, we do a lot with like Get Air, with the movie theaters, with just some, sort of the fun hangouts in our community. Um, we've spent some time, again, with, <laughs> with our animal shelters and, you know, places you can volunteer if you want to do that. Um, the picture in the middle, some of you are probably familiar with the, um, the wheelchair options out at Lincoln City where you can have kids out on the sand if they utilize a wheelchair for um, transportation getting around. And so we've taken kids out to the coast um, to have that experience and some of them have never been able to do that before. Um, and then the, the final picture there is, um, <laughs> so we, we did teach water safety. Um, we had some students that it was a couple years ago and it was like May, June and it was already really hot and they were talking about going out on the water and 
So we connected with a lifeguard and one of our um, staff knew someone with a boat. And so we, we went and spent a day on the Willamette and started teaching about water safety. Um, they are asking if we can do that again with um, inner tubing and I'm a little hesitant on that one, but <laughs> they, my, the staff are so amazing and they're so good at saying, but Melissa, they're gonna do that as adults, so we should probably teach it now. Mm. And we have a saying with our um, staff and with our students and with our families a lot that um, there's dignity and risk. And so that's a, that's a statement that we make because we know that um, for many people that don't experience disability, if you wanna go out on the Willamette and go inner tubing with your friends, nobody questions it. And so for our students, if they wanna go out on the Willamette and go inner tubing with their friends, we're gonna make sure they're ready, but there's dignity and risk and we're gonna say, okay. So um, we do so many different things. I will say that uh, this program would not operate without the creative innovation of our staff and the ability to um, push boundaries sometimes and say it's, it's what's right for students. Um, and so sometimes we argue that we're a school and sometimes we argue that we're not, depending on what it is that we're trying to make possible for kids. Um, but these are just some of the things that we have and I just wanted to share that with you. So I know that we have been here several times and we've presented different um, things that our kids have done, that our students have done. And I don't know if we've ever taken a few minutes to just say what is a community transition program. So really appreciate being able to leave you not with whatever chromium stuff that was and actually being able to send you home with kids um, because ours are pretty amazing. So are there any questions about CTPs that I can try to answer? I know you want to get home too. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the directors start first. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Dr. Yeah, thank Chandler. you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, D Dr. Glover. It was beautiful. I mean, I visited some of your program. I tell you, this is the best part, not only to hand over the graduation diploma in West Salem uh, we had, but, you know, you all do miracles with our children, and it's just see in their face and the staff, and uh, it's just an amazing. Uh, so. Thank you for all that you do and your team, and I've seen it many times, and every time I enjoy being there for the graduation ceremony to watch the fun and also see the smile in their faces, family members, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And the pride. Yep. That's what, that's what we see on their faces when they graduate from transition program because they have a plan. And I so really r r written down some of those wise statements those graduating graduates read it's so meaningful for all of us, including me. <laughs> so keep it as a way to kind of reflect on that. Thank you. Director Bethel. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm very familiar with Community Transition Program. I've been a, a partner and a, a participant in, for years and years, like 20 years, I think. I really love it. So two things, I have a question. You didn't really talk if there was any relationship, you're housed here. To, you mm -hmm. know, three of your classrooms are housed here, or two, three. Three. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what the interaction between the CTP and CTEC is. Mm -hmm. um, so you can answer that. But the second thing is, I want to offer an opportunity. Um, you know, Marion County Sheriff's Office is the is the Marine Patrol authority for the Willamette, and through the Oregon State Marine Board, which through a partnership with Marion County offers all kinds of opportunities for training. And Deputy Garrett Olson, who runs that program for Marion County, is a pretty incredible human being. And I bet he would love the opportunity to work with you and your students because water safety is significant and a priority for us. We've had a lot of deaths on the Willamette in the recent year, um, specifically for you know young adults. So I, I'll, I can follow up with you on that. But I, I think there's an opportunity between both Marion County Sheriff and Polk County Sheriff who manage Willamette to create a partnership, an ongoing relationship with students in the CTP. That's great. I'm sure I already have an email from one of our staff saying do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, as far as our relationship with CTEC and Rhonda, you can feel free to jump into because you're here day to day. Um, what's interesting about our, our programs that are here at CTEC is they started last year. And so that was, that was new for us in the middle of comprehensive distance learning. And so this is the first year that we've really been able to have students on site at the same time as students at CTEC are on site. So um, I know that our staff have been working really closely with the staff with CTEC. We, 
there's, there's this delicate line, um, and I know our team has heard me say this a lot, where these, our students are adults, and so we try to be very careful about um, the relationships that we have with our high schools, because trying to sometimes set the stage that you're not in high school anymore is a complicated one. Um, but we also understand that there are some great partnerships here. So some of the things that I think I know are happening, um, I know we've been working closely with the culinary program around access to the commercial kitchen here. So we have students, um, that's an area in our community that we really struggle to find um, experiences is in true commercial kitchen training. And so that's been a huge benefit to us to be able to have that partnership here for culinary for our students that want to work in restaurants. I think we've also started to work with our um, cosmetology program here on some training opportunities for students um, who want to work in that field as well. So we're, we're, we're bridging those lines, but also trying to remind our 21 year olds that, um, that you're an adult. And so the role is a little different. Sometimes we try and make it like a, a job within CTEC versus being a CTEC student, and that's where we have to um, be really careful that our students truly understand that they're not in high school anymore. Um, but those are those are the big ones that I'm aware of that we've been really working on, Excellent. which meet a need that we haven't been able to fill for many years. So we're really really grateful that we have that opportunity. Director Guzman Ortiz. Yeah, I was. It, it sounds like um, I mean, thank you so much for everything that you've shared. Um, really the, the pictures tell a story. So I, I see why, why you shared that. And just want to comment on um, the comment about self-determination and really encouraging to have that choice. I mean, even as an adult, I think I came to realize I had choice as an adult. So just recognizing how important that is. My question, well, the relationships are really important, right? Staff relationships and with um, participants. So I'm just curious, what does uh, staffing look like, retention, like, what are the opportunities there and then all, you know what are what works and what doesn't just yeah that's a great question um we ha really uh, when staff come to ctps they don't often like to leave um and so we have pretty especially with our a's we have a lot of we have staff that have been part of our ctp programs for years um, and every year the conversation is please don't i never want to leave um, we also, you know, we know that because the job is very different um, than a traditional K-12 setting, part of the conversation when, when staff are looking at joining our programs, if we've been able, because our every year our staff, our programs grow, which means the need for staff supports grow as well. Um, we have conversations with potential, you know, folks who are saying, I want to come to a CTP, and we say, just remember, you're on a city bus all day with kids. You're out in the rain with kids, you know, when they're trying to get to their work site, you're supporting them getting to their work site. And so um, those that find the love in the work um, have stay forever. And then we have some that say, I really want to support in a classroom um, and we don't have really classrooms. So I th our retention, and I'd have to look at the data, but I know that um, I supervised directly the programs for the last four years and we rarely had people leave to go anywhere else. A lot of retirements and those sorts of things, but um, when I met with staff, they always just said, I, I want to be in a CTP for a long time. So, and it's fun. I mean, you get to go out on boats on the river. Yeah. <laughs> Director Nohos Pressy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I also wanted to ask about like that self-determination and yeah, completely understanding about how most of their life, they've just been told do this, be here and um, whatnot. I'm just wondering like how you integrate the family and um, also on that is, is this also like included as they're going through school? Mm -hmm. Like, so prior to the, this program, like, you know, do they get some of those essential skills? Yes, absolutely. So with transition planning in general for students on IEPs, we always start by age 15. Um, so within their IEP, we start developing a transition plan. Many students start younger. In the high school setting, we have youth transition specialists who work, who are liaisons with vocational rehabilitation. So we start um, getting plans in, or getting students into VR as early as 14 sometimes um, to start setting up those supports. So we have a number of students that graduate high school who could be eligible for this program and then don't choose to access it because they've already been set up for the next steps. So a lot of times the kids in our CTPs especially are students that continue to need more instruction in transition skills. Um, there was another question about self-determination, I'm not sure. Oh, the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always an interesting one as well because when students turn 18, they typically become their own guardian. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a conversation that we often start having with families early, as usually as early as 14, 15. 
Um, and, and we really focus on the student as their own decision maker um, with the parent as a support. And so uh, being a guardian, if you're a legal guardian of a student, doesn't mean you're this decision maker for the student. It means you are there to help and guide. And so that's a conversation that we um, start early and we continue to have. Parents continue to be part of the IEP meeting. We always invite them. We say you're an important asset um, to this team. But ultimately, the student is their educational decision maker, um, oftentimes for the first time ever. And that's a tricky conversation when they first come. Um, but I think what we usually find, especially with our families, is um, we know the ownership that everyone has in the ultimate outcome of the, of the student. And as long as we can continue to honor that everybody's part of the team, um, we can usually get there as far as self-determination. But that's really hard for parents, especially when you're a parent of a student who experiences a significant disability, um, to start having those conversations around um, self-determination. And I'm, I'm my own decision maker, and our hope is that we can provide three years of sort of protected time to start making those decisions when you have somebody who can follow up and say, okay, let's talk about why that might not have been the best decision. So parents are a part of the team always, um, but students ultimately, we, we start teaching them to make their own decisions um, and think about parents as a resource and a support for them. I love that. We love to see it. Um, and then I also do want to connect offline about making sure that you folks are getting the best deals on city bus passes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that tonight. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to say thank you for all the hard work that you and your team do. It's very appreciative and teaching these students uh, these essential skills. Um, I do have a quick idea. Maybe we can find a, a shallow pool where you can, the students can test the rafts or the um, inner, yeah, tubes? inner tubes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Instead of the river first. You are all blowing up my emails right now. I already know what's <laughs> happening. Um, yeah, I would love any, so any creative ideas, that's what's so amazing about our programs is we really kind of color outside the lines. We write it into the IEP and we say, well, it's in their IEP, so we have to do it. <laughs> You're so, telling us um, all your secrets now. <laughs> I know, I'm really <laughs> spilling it. But, yeah. you know, kids say, this is what I want to do. And we say, then let's figure out how to make it possible. So yeah. if you have ideas around where we can find a pool, that one is always an interesting um, <laughs> challenge to find a location where kids can, we can work on swimming. Actually, our physical therapists are constantly asking me around I'll where are pool way. options. Yeah. So I, any ideas, you just send them my way. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? You have like 80 plus businesses that support your program. Do we have a way of recognizing all of them like a luncheon or a fundraising so that we can get the word out and get more businesses to sign up <laughs> because some of them will end up hiring our kids and yeah. uh, adults so that uh, we lose those lines of support moving forward or annual recognition mm -hmm. yeah we talk about that every year um, one of the main things that we do um, is at the end of the year we have certificates and thank yous that our students go out and personally deliver to our business partners um, and they usually will write or say or in some ways share with that partner kind of what they learned and what their experience was so it's a kind of a personal one-on-one -on -one thank you from an individual student whose life was changed by the opportunity presented by the business. Um, we've talked about, you know, breakfasts and things like that. And I don't think anything that coordinated has come to fruition. But um, even if we did that, I think the, the individual thank yous yeah. um, has been what we hear from our partners, just what they really appreciate is knowing this made a difference. Absolutely. Yes, Grace. So the programs are from uh, ages 18 to 21. So once they're done with the program, do they still have like other venues of support for uh, like, can they still get help with, you know, essential skills or getting other jobs? Yeah, um, so it depends on what they qualify for as an adult. Okay. Um, most of our students in transition programs qualify for vocational rehabilitation. Um, which is really an agency that supports with employment. So they okay. provide job coaching, job developing. Uh, their goal is to support um, an individual, an adult with a disability, to the point of being employed and being successfully employed for a period of time, and then they fade out. Okay. Um, but the majority of our students do qualify for voc, voc rehab, vocational rehabilitation. Um, and then we do have a small number of students that also qualify for developmental disability services. So these are our students with our most significant needs, intellectual and okay. developmental disabilities. And those agencies are lifetime supports that really support independent living. So personal care, sometimes there's um, in-home in -home supports, okay. um, 
so yeah, they, and that's our goal is to make sure that families and students secure. are completely connected so that when we say goodbye right. to them and they leave goodbye. the district, yeah. it's not like, good luck, no. <laughs> and we, we keep in touch with our students. Okay. We do, uh, um, every summer we do phone calls to all the students who left the year before. So we're in the middle of doing those even right now um, to just, we have a survey and we say, what are you doing now? How are you doing? Um, and so our students usually have, who've gone through transition programs have done pretty well. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. I love the creative source, creative ideas. <laughs> Thank you for having yeah. me. I, I love talking about these programs in case you can't tell. So yes. have a great night. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I think that's our last <coughs> agenda item. And before we close out, just want to say uh, thank you to all the staff that made this possible, that put, put all these tables together, Capital Community Media. Uh, thank you for being here, our translators and interpreters um, as well. Again, uh, just email board leadership for uh, questions that you may have or agenda topic items. So appreciate it. And I think we'll call it a night. We're adjourned. So yeah. grab my big old CTE <laughs> mallet. Be careful. And <laughs> we need to turn. And break the cafe table. No dance.